Dictionary of Commentary on the Heidelberg Catechism by Zacharias Ursinus, translated by G. W. Williard, the Eighth Commandment. Forty-second Lord's Day, question 110, what doth God forbid in the Eighth Command? Answer, God forbids not only those thefts and robberies which are punishable by the magistrate, but he comprehends under the name of theft all wicked tricks and devices whereby we design to appropriate to ourselves the goods which belong to our neighbour, whether it be by force or under the appearance of right, as by unjust weights, ills, measures, fraudulent merchandise, false coins, usury, or by any other way forbidden by God, as also all covetousness, all waste and abuse of his gifts. Question 111. But what doth God require in this command? Answer. That I promote the advantage of my neighbour in every instance I can or may, and deal with him as I desire to be dealt with by others, further also that I faithfully labour, so that I may be able to relieve the needy. Exposition. This commandment sanctions and authorises a distinction in property or possessions. The end or design of this commandment is the preservation of the property or possessions which God has given to every one for the support of life, for if it is not lawful or becoming for us to steal, it is necessary that every man should possess that which lawfully belongs to him. God, therefore, in this commandment, forbids all frauds, together with all the cunning devices and arts by which the goods and possessions of our neighbour are injured, diminished, or confounded, so as to lose his right in them, or to make it doubtful. In forbidding these things, God at the same time enjoins all those virtues which contribute to the preservation of our neighbour's goods and possessions. Thou shalt not steal, that is, thou shalt not desire or attempt to take to thyself thy neighbour's goods by fraud. Therefore thou shalt defend, preserve, and increase them, and give unto thy neighbour what belongs to him. God calls the things that are forbidden theft, in order that he might comprehend and condemn unto this, as being the grossest kind of fraud, all other sins of a kindred nature, with their antecedents and consequence. The Virtues of the Eighth Commandment First, commutative justice is a virtue in the acquisition of goods which does not desire the possessions of another and contributes to an arithmetical equality in contracts and in the ordinary traffic amongst men in the purchase and exchange of goods according to just laws. Commutative justice then consists in preserving an equality between merit and reward, wages and labour, etc., whether it be in the acquisition or disposition of goods. Justinian, the Roman emperor, writes in relation to the possession and division of things, that some things are common to all by natural right, as the air, water, the sea, the shores of the sea, etc. Some things are public, as rivers, ports, the use of the banks of rivers, etc. Some belong to no one as things sacred, religious, and holy. The largest amount of things, however, belong to persons privately and singly, and are acquired in various ways. Those things, therefore, which are transferred to another owner, or which any one takes to himself, belong either to no one or to someone. Those which belong to no one become the property of the persons who acquire them. Those things which belong rightly to someone can only pass into the hands of others, either by violence or against the will of the rightful owner, or by captivity in war, or with the consent of the owner, as by inheritance or contract. Possessions pass into the hands of others by inheritance, either by will or without any will. A contract is an agreement between certain persons in reference to the transfer, giving, or exchange of possessions, according to just and wholesome laws. All contracts are included under commutative justice, and may be comprehended under ten classes. 1. Buying and selling, when an article passes from the vendor to the purchaser, in such a way that the purchaser gives a just and equivalent price for it. This is sometimes accompanied with a condition of selling it again, or it may be without this condition. The buying of revenues, or the receiving an income belongs to this, and is no more to be regarded as usury than the letting out of land for which a certain yearly rent is required. 2. Borrowing is a contract according to which the use of a certain thing is transferred to another in such a way that he returns that which is equivalent. There is something given in borrowing, not that the same thing may be returned but only that which is similar or of equal value. Lending is that which takes place when the use of a certain thing is granted to someone for a certain length of time when he is to return the self-same thing whole and without any injury, without having to pay any remuneration for the use of it. 4. Donation, where a certain thing is transferred to another person without recompense by the rightful owner who alone has the right to give it by free will. But should someone say that justice demands that like should be given for like, and that inasmuch as this is not done, in what is given as a donation, it must conflict with justice, we would reply that this is true only in case the things are given with the intention that a compensation be made. 5. Exchange, 
where things are exchanged by the consent of those who are lawful owners, or when one thing is given for another which is equal in value. 6. Leasing or letting out is a contract according to which the use of a certain thing, without any right of possession, is given over to another person by the rightful owner for a certain length of time, upon the condition that he to whom it is leased pay a given sum for its use and return it again in a proper state at the expiration of the time for which it was let. 7. Pledging or mortgaging is when a certain thing is transferred to another person which gives him a right to it as long as certain things which are due him are not paid, or it is a contract which takes place when a certain thing is delivered to another person upon this condition, that he has the right of using it according to his own pleasure, in case it is not redeemed within a certain time. 8. Committing in trust is a contract according to which neither the use nor possession, but only the keeping of a certain thing is entrusted to another person. 9. Partnership is a contract between certain persons who associate themselves together in business, according to which one person gives his funds, and the other his attention or labour, upon the condition that they receive or bear an equal proportion of the loss or gain, and that neither one reap the entire gain or sustain the whole loss. 10. There is lastly a contract according to which the use or possession of a piece of land is transferred by the owner to a farmer, to till, upon the condition that he cultivate it and be bound to render to the owner thereof some particular service. These different kinds of contracts are to be observed for the better understanding of commutative justice. There is opposed to this virtue every unjust and unlawful transfer of property, whether it be effected by violence as robberies, or by fraud and deceit as theft. Theft is the taking of that which belongs to another, without his knowledge and will, with the intention to deprive him of it. There are many ways in which theft is practiced both in public and private life, of which we may mention the following. 1. Embezzling or taking that which belongs to the state or commonwealth. 2. Sacrilege which consists in taking some sacred or holy thing. 3. The various deceptions which are practiced in merchandising, as when anyone uses fraud and artifice in effecting contracts or sales, together with all the wicked tricks and devices by which anyone designs to appropriate to himself what belongs to another. 4. Usury is the gain which is received in view of that which has been borrowed or loaned. All just contracts, the contracts of paying rent, a just compensation for any loss, partnership, buying, etc., are exempted from usury. There are many questions respecting usury concerning which we may judge according to the rule which Christ has laid down. Whatever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. Second, contentment is a virtue by which we are satisfied and contented with our present possessions, which we have honestly acquired and by which we quietly endure poverty and other inconveniences, not desiring what does not belong to us, nor what is unnecessary. The extremes of this virtue are, on the side of want, avarice and theft, and on the side of excess, a feigned refusal, as when any one would make it appear that he is unwilling to receive that which he nevertheless would and greatly desires. Also inhumanity, which is not to receive anything. Third, Fidelity is a virtue which has a concern and anxiety in regard to the losses and privations of another, and endeavours to avert them, willingly and diligently performing all the different duties which are devolving upon us in our appropriate callings, in order that we may have what is necessary to sustain us and ours, and that we may also have that with which we may supply the wants of others, all of which is done with the design that we may glorify God thereby. The extremes of this virtue are 1. Unfaithfulness, which has no care in regard to the losses and injuries of others, and does not diligently perform what duty requires. 2. Negligence and slothfulness, which merely desires to reap public good without contributing anything thereto. Objection, but mention has already been made of fidelity in the fifth commandment, therefore it does not properly belong here. Answer, it is not absurd that one and the same virtue should be placed under different commandments for different ends and in different respects, for the ends and designs of different actions and virtues make a difference in the things themselves. Fidelity is placed under this commandment in as far as it includes a desire to guard against the disadvantages and losses of others, and to do those things by which we may acquire for ourselves food, raiment, and such things as are necessary. And it is placed under the fifth commandment in so far as it includes obedience in doing our duty. Fourth, liberality is a virtue which contributes of its substance to those who are in want, from right considerations and motives, or it is a virtue by which those who are possessed of it communicate of their own possessions to others, without being urged thereto by any civil constraint or enactment, but by the divine and natural law, or for the sake of godliness and charity with a liberal heart, according to their ability and the necessity of others, 
knowing where, to whom, when, and how much they are able to give, and at the same time preserve a medium between penuriousness and prodigality. The extreme of this virtue on the side of want are penuriousness, meanness, and covetousness, which may be said to consist in a desire on the part of any one to increase his possessions by right or wrong, or which by a want of confidence in God and a trust in the possessions of fortune is not contented with those things which God gives by lawful means, but desires more and more, and seeks to take to itself, even by unlawful means, what it has no right to, and does not give where God requires that we should exercise our liberality. The other extreme of this virtue shows itself in prodigality, or in a lavish expenditure of what God has committed to our trust, which gives beyond the bounds of propriety, and without any necessity, being actuated thereto by delight in an excessive use or waste of our gifts and possessions. Fifth, hospitality is a species of liberality, and is that by which we entertain strangers and travellers, and especially those who have been banished on account of the profession of the doctrine of the gospel, with true Christian charity, and with all the duties of hospitality. Or it consists in liberality and kindness towards strangers, especially towards Christians, who are driven into exile on account of religion, or are forced to travel for the confession of the truth. The extremes of this virtue are, on the one side, a want of hospitality towards strangers, and on the other, extravagance in entertaining them, so exhausting the fountain of our beneficence that we are not left with those things which are necessary for ourselves. Sixth, parsimony is that virtue by which we guard against all unnecessary expense, and by which we take care of that which we have honestly acquired for ourselves, and for those who are connected with us in the relation's life, not desiring more than what is necessary for our comfort. Liberality has parsimony connected with it, for liberality without parsimony runs into prodigality, and parsimony without liberality soon degenerates into covetousness. They are therefore virtues which are closely allied, and are two means between the same extremes, viz. covetousness and prodigality. Neither can any one be liberal who is not parsimonious or frugal, nor can any one who is not frugal be liberal. Liberality enlarges our contributions according to sound reason, whilst parsimony restricts the same according to sound reason, retaining as much as propriety will admit of, and giving as much as is needed. It is in this way that these two virtues are exercised in regard to the same object, and are between the same extremes, so that the same vices which stand in opposition to liberality are repugnant to parsimony, which vices are prodigality and covetousness. Seventh, Frugality is a virtue having respect to household affairs, disposing of what has been honestly acquired, properly and profitable, and for things necessary and useful, or which incurs expense merely for such things as are necessary and useful, it is closely allied to parsimony, and yet it is evidently not the same. Parsimony consists in giving moderately, frugality in a proper disposition of things. They are both referred to and comprehended under this commandment, because their opposite, which is prodigality, is here forbidden, the extremes of this virtue are the same as those which we mentioned under parsimony. Objections against the distinction which we have made in reference to possessions. Objection 1. The apostles had all good things in common, therefore we ought to have all things in common. Answer 1. The examples are not the same, for a community of goods in the time of the apostles was easy and necessary. It was easy because the disciples were few in number. It was necessary because there was great danger that if they did not sell them they would be wrested from them by violence. It is different, however, as it respects the church at the present time, for such a community of goods would now be neither easy nor necessary. The apostles were therefore led, for just and sufficient reasons, to have such a community of goods which causes are now no more in existence. Two, they did it freely, and not by any law constraining them to adopt such measures. Each one did it of his own accord. Hence Peter said to Ananias, While it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Acts 5 verse 4. It was therefore voluntary. 3. It was a particular custom, not having respect to the whole church, for it was not observed in all the churches. Alms were collected in Macedonia and Archaea, and sent to Jerusalem. 4. It was temporary, for it was afterwards abolished, when the causes which first gave rise to it passed away. Objection 2. Things which are natural are unchangeable. Community of goods is natural, therefore it is unchangeable, and is to be observed at this day. Answer. Natural things are unchangeable in respect to the moral law, but not in respect to natural benefits and utility. Objection 3. Christ said to the young man in the gospel, If thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that thou hast, and give to the poor. Matthew 19, verse 21. 
Answer, there is a difference in the examples. One, because the calling of a disciple was special, having respect to the apostleship. Two, Christ designed by this to show this young man how far he was from the perfection of the law of which he boasted. Three, Christ did not say, give it in common or cast it in the common treasury, but give to the poor. Objection four, all things belong to Christ, therefore all things belong to Christians. Answer, all things are ours as it respects the right to the thing, but not as it respects our right in the thing. All things are due to us, but it is not proper for us to lay hold upon anything before the time. Objection 5. Friends have things in common. Answer. Friends have things in common not as it respects the ownership and possession of property, but only in their use and enjoyment, according to just laws, or they have them in common as touching the use and duties of propriety, advantage, and necessity, according to sound reason, for we ought to desire those things from our friends which we desire them to ask from us. All things, however, are not common among friends as touching their possession and right, because every one has a distinct possession and right to his own goods. This possession of goods or distinction of rights is recognized and sanctioned by this commandment, as we have already remarked. For if we may not steal, it is necessary that we should possess what properly belongs to us, and that for these reasons, one, that we may honestly maintain and support ourselves and those who are depending upon us, two, that we may have something to contribute towards the preservation of the church, three, that we may assist in upholding the interests of the state according to our ability, four, that we may be able to confer benefits upon our friends and contribute to the relief of the poor and needy. End of section 70. Section 71 of Commentary on the Heidelberg Catechism by Zacharias Ursinus, translated by G. W. Williard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Ninth Commandment. Forty-third Lord's Day, Question 112. What is required in the Ninth Commandment? Answer, that I bear false witness against no man, nor falsify any man's words, that I be no backbiter or slanderer, that I do not judge or join in condemning any man rashly or unheard, but that I avoid all sorts of lies and deceit, as the proper works of the devil, unless I would bring down upon me the heavy wrath of God. Likewise, that in judgment and other dealings I love the truth, speak it uprightly and confess it. Also, that I defend and promote as much as I am able the honor and good character of my neighbor. Exposition the design or end of this ninth commandment is the establishment and preservation of truth amongst men. It forbids, therefore, the bearing of false witness and all other things which are closely allied to it, the genus of which is lying. Thou shalt not bear false witness of or against thy neighbor. There is in this negative precept an affirmative, which is, Thou shalt bear true witness of or for thy neighbor, that is, if thou wilt be true, love to learn and speak the truth. The head, the fountain, and genus, as it were, of the virtues which are here enjoined, is truth, or rather veracity, in our words, thoughts, judgments, contracts, and in our doctrine. For by truth, as it is here used, we are to understand the agreement or correspondence which our knowledge or words have with the thing of which we affirm something. We call that speech or declaration true which harmonizes and agrees with the thing itself. So, on the other hand, falsehood, in the premises which we have laid down is the fountain, the genus of all the vices which are here condemned. Virtues of the Ninth Commandment 1. Truth or veracity is a firm purpose or choice in the will, by which we constantly embrace true thoughts and opinions, and profess and defend the same according to a sense of duty and the circumstances in which we are placed, keep contracts and promises, and avoid both in our speech and deportment all deceitful dissemblings for the glory of God and the safety of our neighbor. According to this end, the devil cannot be true, even though he may at times speak that which is true, for he alone is true who speaks and loves the truth, and has a desire to promote it for the glory of God and the safety of his fellow men. Aristotle reasons in his ethics briefly, but most learnedly, concerning this virtue. He refers truth in contracts to justice, and calls him properly a true man, who, when it profits him nothing, is nevertheless true in his speech and life and is habitually such, from which it appears again that the devil and men are liars, and not true, although they may sometimes speak the truth. Truth comprehends liberty of speech or boldness, which is a virtue by which we profess the truth fearlessly and willingly, 
to as great an extent as is required by the time place and necessity of the occasion the confession of the truth is enjoined both in this and in the third commandment as the same virtue is often regarded and included in the obedience of different commandments yet it is required here in a different respect from what it is in the third commandment there it is required as it is the immediate worship and praise of god here as we are unwilling to deceive our neighbour but desire that his character and safety be preserved there is opposed to this virtue on the side of want one falsehood or lying which comprehends all the various kinds of fraud deceit dissembling lies of courtesy slanders backbitings and evil speaking which forms of lying are also opposed to candour the same thing may also be said of such negligence as does not seek to obtain a true knowledge of things together with wilful ignorance which is a lie in the understanding two vanity or levity which is a readiness for lying he is a vain person who lies much often and readily and that without any shame he is a liar who has a desire and fondness for lying a lie is when any one speaks or declares by outward signs differently from what he thinks and from what the thing itself is to lie is to go against one's own mind and knowledge all lies now which clearly dissemble and cover the truth are here condemned nor are those lies which are uttered for politeness sake excused because we may not do evil that good may come lactantius very correctly says quote, we should never lie because a lie always injures and deceives someone end quote. truth however which is uttered by a sign is no lie whether he to whom the sign is made understands it or not yet we may here remark that we should not be too severe and rigid in passing sentence upon the actions of the saints neither should we make an apology for those things which need none officious lies are often defended by bringing forward the egyptian midwives who lied to the king and were nevertheless blessed of god but god did not bless them because they lied but because they feared him and would not slay the children of the israelites objection that which profits another without injuring any one may be done lies which are uttered out of respect or for fear of giving offence do not injure any one but may result in good therefore they may be uttered without any sin answer we deny the minor proposition because that which god prohibits always injures someone and if such lies ever profit any one it is by an accident on account of the goodness of god see augustine liber de mendatio ad consentium there is opposed to truth as it respects the other extreme one an untimely profession of the truth which is to cast pearls before swine and to give that which is holy to the dogs as christ says who by these words forbids such a profession of the truth as not made at the proper time and when no necessity demands it for it is correctly said he who admonishes at the wrong time injures two curiosity which is to inquire into what is not necessary or impossible let these remarks suffice respecting truth the principal virtue comprehended under this commandment all the other virtues which are here commended wait upon truth or contribute to it and are as it were certain appendages of it second candor is a virtue which understands in a proper light things correctly and honestly spoken or done and puts the most favourable construction upon such things as are doubtful in as far as there are any just reasons for doing it and does not readily entertain suspicions or indulge in them although there might be sufficient cause for doing so and does not base any actions upon these suspicions nor resolve anything in consequence thereof or it is a virtue closely related to truth sanctioning other conclusions when there are probable reasons for them not indulging any ill will understanding in the most probable light things that are doubtful and hoping that which is good but yet thinking concerning things changeable that the minds of men may be changed and that a man may err respecting another's intention since the inmost recesses of the human heart are never brought fully to light there is opposed to candour as it respects the want of it calumny and suspiciousness calumny is not only to criminate and find fault with the innocent where there is no reason for it but it is also to put the very worst construction upon things spoken indifferently or to propagate and coin what is false suspiciousness is to understand things spoken correctly or ambiguously in the worst light and to suspect evil things from those that are good or to entertain suspicions where there is no just cause for so doing and where there are any proper reasons for suspicions to indulge in them to too great an extent it is lawful for us at times to have suspicions unless we wish to be the dupes and fools of others hence the saviour says beware of men be ye wise as serpents and harmless as doves 
Matthew 10, verses 16 and 17, but it is one thing to have suspicions and another to indulge them. Suspicion now is the entertaining of an evil or unfavorable opinion of someone on account of some probable and sufficient cause, whether true or apparent. It is twofold, good and evil. 1. It is evil when it proceeds from a cause altogether false or insufficient, as when a certain cause is imagined which is groundless, or when our neighbor is innocent. It is good when our suspicions are based upon just and sufficient grounds. 2. It is an evil suspicion when any one resolves upon something merely upon suspicion. It is good when the matter is left in suspense as long as there are probable causes on both sides. 3. It is evil when any one conceives the design to injure a certain one merely upon the ground of suspicion. It is good when the contrary takes place. 4. It is evil when any one is led to indulge hatred to another upon the ground of suspicion. Good suspicions proceed differently. There is, on the other side of this virtue, as it respects the extreme of excess, one, foolish credulity and flattery. Blind or foolish credulity is to interpret anything rashly or hastily, and to assent to it without just and probable reasons. Or it is to believe a thing upon the declaration of another, when there are evident and sufficient reasons to the contrary. Flattery consists in praising and admiring things which should not be praised for the purpose of obtaining the fortune or favor of someone. Candor is an assistant or species of truth, and is therefore here enjoined and commended in simplicity with truth. Third, simplicity is truth in its nakedness, without any shiftings, prevarication, or quibbles, and it is a virtue which honestly and openly speaks and does what is true, right, and understood in arts and common life. Truth is regulated and tempered by candor and simplicity. The extremes of this virtue are a feigned simplicity and duplicity in manners and conversation. Fourth, constancy is a virtue which does not depart from the truth in as far as it is known, and which does not change its purpose and design without a necessary and sufficient reason, but constantly says and does what is true, just, and necessary. Or, it is a virtue holding fast to the truth once discovered, known and approved of, with a profession and defense of it, in the like manner. Constancy is necessary for the preservation of truth, and is therefore here enjoined. The extremes of this virtue are, on the side of want, inconstancy, which is to change one's mind and opinion without any sufficient reason, and on the side of excess, it is obstinacy or stoical rigor which clings to false opinions, and persists in doing what is unjust and unprofitable, although convinced to the contrary. It is a vice which arises from the confidence which any one has in his own wisdom, or from pride and ostentation, and shows itself in an unwillingness to yield its own judgment or opinion, which is seen to be false from many solid arguments. Fifth, docility is a virtue which investigates the reasons of those opinions which are true, readily yields and assents to those who teach or show things which are better, and that for reasons sound and convincing, and at the same time disposes the will to fall in with and assent to those reasons which are true and satisfactory, and to abandon what was before received and entertained. The extremes of this virtue are the same as those of constancy. Docility is also necessary to constancy, for constancy without docility would degenerate into obstinacy, and docility without constancy would degenerate into fickleness and inconstancy. The virtues, which we have thus far enumerated under this commandment, are naturally and closely connected together, for it is necessary that truth should be tempered and regulated by simplicity and candor, that it should be perceived and acknowledged by docility and preserved by candor. In this way, the preceding virtues are necessary to the existence of truth. The three following virtues are necessary in order that it may be profitable in the world. Sixth, taciturnity, or a discreet observance of silence, is a virtue which keeps to itself things not known and not necessary to be told, where, when, and in so far as it is proper to do so, and at the same time avoids an immoderate use of the tongue in uttering such things as prudence would require not to be told. Or, it is such a profession of the truth as that which keeps to itself things that are secret, whether true or false, and which avoids conversation that is unnecessary and useless, especially that which is untimely, baneful, and calculated to give offence. The extremes of this virtue are, on the one side, gossiping, foolish talking, and treachery, Gossiping or prattling is not to be able to retain anything, even things which should be kept secret. Foolish talking is to speak unseasonably, immoderately, and foolishly. 
treachery as to betray honest enterprises and plans to the injury of those whose friend the betrayer seems and ought to be, and not to defend nor have any regard to the danger of another when it is proper and possible to do so, and still further to relate things not worthy of being told, the narration of which is an injury to him to whom it is told, and to disclose such things as must necessarily be spoken with no good intention or design, and lastly to utter anything by perjury or falsehood, that which is opposed to this virtue, as it respects the extreme of excess, may be included in moroseness and undue reservedness. Moroseness consists in being silent and keeping back the truth when it ought to be declared. Wenn man einem die Wort muss abkaufen. Undue reservedness is to dissemble the truth where the glory of God and the salvation of our fellow men require a profession of it. Seventh. Affability, or readiness of speaking, is a virtue which hears, answers, and speaks willingly, and with evidence of good will, where it is proper by reason of some necessary or probable cause. Or it is a virtue which makes others feel easy in their interviews with those who are possessed of this grace, and at the same time gives evidence of good will in conversation, speech, and gesture. Or it is a virtue which consists in hearing and answering with a declaration and evidence of good will. Taciturnity without affability becomes moroseness or peevishness, whilst affability without taciturnity degenerates into gossiping, prattling, and foolish talking. Eighth, urbanity, being that which seasons and recommends truth and speech under every form, is the truth figuratively spoken, for the purpose of moving, exhorting, and delighting others, having a proper regard to the circumstances of the person's time and place, or... It is a facility and power of speaking the truth with a certain degree of grace, so as to teach, comfort, cheer, excite, and move others, without being accompanied by any unpleasantness or bitterness. The extremes of this virtue are, on the one side, scurrility, raillery, and backbiting. Scurrility consists in obscene and low jesting, especially in holy things. Scura, which means a person who jests in the manner just described, is so called from the Greek skor, which means filth because he speaks what is obscene and filthy. Raillery is a vice which consists in bitter jesting or scoffing, and in deriding and vexing others, especially those who ought to be pitied. Backbiting is that which puts false reports into circulation in regard to others, and puts the worst construction upon what is spoken doubtfully, with a desire of revenge, and of injuring and exciting prejudice and opposition against someone. Foolishness and a want of taste constitute the other extreme of urbanity, Foolishness is an affectation of urbanity which is altogether inappropriate and out of place, whilst a want of taste shows itself in a silly imitation of urbanity. End of section 71section 72 of Commentary on the Heidelberg Catechism by Zacharias Ursinus, translated by G. W. Williard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Tenth Commandment. Forty-fourth Lord's Day. Question 113. What doth the Tenth Commandment require of us? Answer, that even the smallest inclination or thought, contrary to any of God's commands, never rise in our hearts, but that at all times we hate sin with our whole hearts, and delight in all righteousness. Exposition. That this commandment, which has respect to lust or concupiscence, is one and not two, is evident, one from the fact that Moses repeats it in a different order in Exodus 20 verse 17 and Deuteronomy 5 verse 21, as we have already shown. Two from the fact that Moses comprehends it in one verse in both of the places to which we have just referred. Three from the interpretation of Paul, who comprises in one commandment all that Moses says in relation to this subject when he says, I had not known lust except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. Romans 7 verse 7. 4. From the fact that the papists and others are accustomed in their expositions of this part of the Decalogue to join together the coveting of our neighbour's house and wife, because they without doubt perceived that the coveting of our neighbour's wife, house, and all other things which belong to our neighbour are here forbidden, and for one and the same reason. It follows, therefore, either that there is but one precept touching concupiscence, or that there must be as many commandments enumerated as there are things belonging to our neighbour which we are forbidden to covet. 
5. From the authority of the best ancient writers, both among the Jews and Christians, to whom we have referred in our remarks upon the division of the Decalogue. The design and end of this commandment is the internal obedience and regulation of all our affections towards God, and our neighbours and his goods, which must also be included in all the other commandments. Should someone object and say, therefore this commandment is superfluous inasmuch as it requires nothing new, or which has not been expressed in the foregoing precepts, we reply that it is not superfluous, seeing that it is added to the other commandments as a general rule and interpretation, according to which the internal obedience of all the other commandments must be understood, because this is spoken of the whole Decalogue generally. This commandment, therefore, enjoins original righteousness towards God and our neighbour, which consists in a true knowledge of God in the mind, with an inclination in the will to obey the will of God as known. It also forbids concupiscence, which is an inordinate desire or corrupt inclination, coveting those things which God has forbidden. It properly, however, commands original righteousness towards our neighbour, which is a desire and inclination to perform towards our neighbour all the duties which are required from us, and to preserve and defend his safety. There are two extremes of this original righteousness here forbidden. One, original sin towards our neighbour, which is called concupiscence, which consists in desiring and wishing those things which would be an injury to our neighbour. Two, an inordinate love of our neighbour, which leads to the neglect of God for his sake. There are some who hold that concupiscence and original sin are one and the same thing, but they differ in the same way in which an effect differs from a cause, or as a part of a thing differs from the whole. Concupiscence is a propensity to those things which are prohibited by the divine law. Original sin is the state of condemnation in which the whole human race has become involved by the fall, and a want of the knowledge and will of God. We must here observe that not only are corrupt and disordered inclinations sins, but the thinking of evil, in as far as it is concerned with an inclination and propensity to pursue it, or with a desire to practice it, is sin. Concupiscence, although it is without doubt born in us, is both an evil and sin, for we are not to judge according to nature, but according to the law whether a thing be sin or not. Whatever is opposed to the law is sin, whether it be born in us or not. The Pelagians denied that concupiscence is sin. The law, on the contrary, declares thou shalt not covet. And Paul says, I had not known sin, but by the law, for I had not known lust except the law had said, thou shalt not covet. Romans 7 verse 7. The Pelagians were condemned in many councils, which were called together on account of the errors of Pelagius and Celestius, about the year of our Lord 420, and subsequently. The Principal Arguments of the Pelagians Objection 1. Natural things are not sins. Concupiscence is natural, therefore it is no sin. Answer. There is here a fallacy of the accident in the minor proposition, for inordinate concupiscence was not before the fall, but became joined to our nature after the fall. It is therefore not natural in itself, but is by an accident, inasmuch as it is now, since the fall, born with us, or it is natural in the sense that it is an evil accident, connecting itself inseparably with a nature good in itself. Or, we may reply to the objection thus, there are four terms in this syllogism arising from the ambiguity of the word natural. In the major it signifies a thing created good by God naturally, viz. a natural desire of man before the fall, which was not contrary to the will of God. But in the minor it signifies a thing which does not properly belong to us by creation, but which we have brought upon ourselves by the fall. To this it is objected, a natural desire or inclination which works those things which contribute to the preservation of man, and avoids those which are injurious, is not sinful, even though it belongs to a corrupt nature, because it is created by God, and is a desire good in itself. Such now is concupiscence, therefore it is no sin. Answer. We reply to the major proposition that appetites and desires are good in themselves in as far as they are mere desires. It is different, however, with those desires which are inordinate and which are directed upon objects prohibited by God, as in the case with all the appetites and desires of our corrupt nature, because they are either not directed upon such objects as they ought, or not in the manner and with the design with which they should be, so that they are all corrupt and sinful. An evil tree cannot bring forth good fruit. Matthew 7 verse 18. To desire the fruit of a tree was natural, but to desire it contrary to the express command of God, as Eve did, 
was in its own nature wicked and sinful. Objection to that which is impossible for us to produce in ourselves or to prevent is no sin. Concupiscence now is in us in such a way that we can neither throw it off nor produce it in ourselves. Therefore it is no sin. Answer. The major proposition is false, for sin is not to be estimated by any liberty or necessity of our nature, but by the law and will of God. Whatever is in opposition to the law is sin, whether men have power to avoid it or not. Nor does God do any injustice to us by requiring from us that which we cannot perform, because he demanded these things of us when they were possible, and gave us the power to perform them. And although we have now lost this power, yet God has not lost his right to demand what he committed to our trust. For further remarks upon this subject, we would refer the reader to what has been said in the exposition of the ninth question of the Catechism, page 66. Objection 3. Sin renders man obnoxious to the eternal wrath of God. Concupiscence does not expose those who are regenerated to the wrath of God, for there is no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Romans 8 verse 1. Therefore, concupiscence is no sin, at least not in the regenerate. Answer. There is a fallacy of accident in the minor proposition, for that concupiscence does not condemn the regenerate comes to pass by an accident, which is the grace of God, which does not impute it to the faithful. This, however, does not occur in this way, as though concupiscence were no sin, for other sins in like manner do not condemn the regenerate, not because they are no sins, but because they have obtained the pardon of them through Christ. Objection 4. Original sin is removed in baptism, therefore concupiscence is no sin in those who are baptized. We reply to the antecedent that original sin is not simply and wholly removed in baptism, but merely as it respects its guilt. Corruption and an inclination to sin remain still in those who are baptized. This is what the schoolmen mean when they say, quote, the formal part of sin is removed, but the material remains, end quote. Should anyone reply that where the formal part of sin is removed, there the thing itself is removed, inasmuch as the form gives being to the thing, so that original sin itself must be removed in baptism. We answer that there is here an error in understanding that to be spoken generally, which is true only in a certain respect. The formal part of sin is removed, not simply, but in respect to the guilt of sin, for the formal part of sin is twofold, and includes, one, opposition to the law and an inclination to sin, 2. Guilt or desert of punishment. The guilt of sin is removed, but the inclination remains. I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind. Romans 7 verse 23. End of section 72. Section 73 of Commentary on the Heidelberg Catechism by Zacharias Osinus. Translated by G. W. Williard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Possibility of Obedience to the Law Question 114. But can those who are converted to God perfectly keep these commands? Answer. No, but even the holiest men, while in this life, have only small beginnings of this obedience, yet so that with a sincere resolution they begin to live, not only according to some, but all the commands of God. Exposition the question which here claims our attention is, how is obedience to the law possible, and can those who are regenerated keep the law perfectly? Which is the seventh division proposed under the general subject of the law of God. That this question may be the better understood, we shall distinguish the nature of man as it was when it first came from the hands of God, pure and holy, as fallen and as regenerated. Perfect obedience to the whole law was possible to the nature of man before it was corrupted by sin, and that as it respects every part and degree of obedience, as it is to the angels. For man was created good and after the image of God, in righteousness and true holiness. The nature of man in its corrupt state, since the fall, is entirely unable to fulfill what the law demands. Yea, it cannot so much as commence acceptable obedience to God, according to the following declarations of Scripture. The imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth, can the Ethiopian change his skin, or the leopard his spots? Then may ye also do good that are accustomed to do evil. A corrupt tree cannot bring forth good fruit. Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Ye were dead in trespasses and sins, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency as of God. 
Genesis 8, verse 21, Jeremiah 13, verse 23, Matthew 7, verse 18, Romans 4, verse 23, Ephesians 2, verse 13, 2 Corinthians 3, verse 5. The obedience of the law is possible in the regenerate, one, as touching external propriety and discipline, two, as it respects the imputation of Christ's righteousness, or by the benefit of justification and regeneration which we obtain by faith, three, as it respects the commencement of internal and external obedience in this life, this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. 1 John 5 verse 3. He that boasts that he knows and worships God without the commencement of obedience or regeneration is a liar. But the law is impossible to the regenerate in respect to God, or the perfect internal and external obedience which it requires. Enter not into judgment with thy servant, for in thy sight shall no man living be justified. Psalm 143 verse 2. 1. Because the regenerate do not fulfill the law perfectly, but do many things in opposition to it. 2. Because even those things which they do according to the law are imperfect, for there are still many sins remaining in the regenerate, as original sin and many actual sins, neglects, omissions, and infirmities, which sins the godly acknowledge and bewail in themselves. We are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. Isaiah 64 verse 6. There is, however, a great difference between the regenerate and the unregenerate when they sin. 1. God has a purpose to save the regenerate. 2. There is a certain final repentance on the part of the regenerate. 3. Even with the sins of the regenerate, there is always remaining some beginning or seed of true faith and conversion. It is different, however, as it respects the unregenerate, for in regard to them God has no purpose, as in the case of the godly, neither is there any certain final repentance in their case, nor any beginning of new obedience, but they sin willingly and persist in their opposition to God, and at length perish unless they are converted. Objections against the imperfection of works in the regenerate. Objection 1. The works of the Holy Spirit cannot be imperfect. The good works of the regenerate are the works of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, it must needs be that they are perfect, considered even in themselves. Answer. There is here an error in regarding that to be absolutely true, which is true only in a certain respect. Those works which are wrought simply by the Holy Spirit must needs be perfect and pure. But the works of the regenerate are of the Holy Spirit not absolutely, but in such a way that they are at the same time the works of the regenerate themselves. Hence this is all that follows, that the works of the saints are pure in as far as they are suggested and wrought by the Holy Spirit, but in as far as they are also of men, who are as yet imperfect and fallible, they are works accompanied with many defects and with much that is evil. Objection 2. The works of those who are conformed to the image of Christ cannot be imperfect. The saints are in this life conformed to Christ by their regeneration and adoption into the family of God. Therefore, their works cannot be imperfect. Answer. There is here the same error which we noticed in replying to the former objection. The major proposition is spoken in reference to those who are perfectly conformed to the image of Christ, whilst the saints, of whom the minor proposition speaks, are conformed to Christ only in part, as long as they continue on earth. For, as our knowledge is, so is our love and conformity with Christ. But here we know only in part, and prophesy only in part, as the Apostle says. Hence our conformity with Christ is not perfect. Objection 3. There is no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Romans 8 verse 1. The saints are in Christ, therefore their works are perfectly good, considered even in themselves. Answer. There is here a fallacy in regarding that as a cause which is none, for it is not the perfection of the works of the regenerate, but the satisfaction of Christ imputed to them by faith, which is the cause on account of which there is no condemnation to them. Hence, this is all that follows that the works of the regenerate are perfect, either in themselves or in respect to the satisfaction of God imputed to them, and not condemned as impure in the judgment of God. Objection 4. The severity of divine justice does not render good according to works which are not perfectly good, but Christ in the final judgment will render to every one, and so to the saints also, according to their works. Therefore the works of the saints are so perfect that they will in themselves stand in the judgment of God. Answer. There are here four terms, because the major must be understood of a legal reward of works, whilst the minor must be understood of a reward which is evangelical, or to express it differently, we may say that the justice of God does not render good according to works which are imperfect, if he judges according to the covenant of perfect obedience to the law. But Christ, in rewarding the works of the saints, will not judge according to the covenant of perfect works, but according to the covenant of faith, 
or of his own righteousness imputed and applied to them by faith, and yet he will judge them according to their works, as according to the evidences of their faith, from which their works have proceeded, and which they, as the fruits of this faith, declare them to be. Objection 5. The Scriptures attribute perfection to the works of the saints. Blessed are they that keep his testimonies, and that seek him with the whole heart. With my whole heart have I sought thee. Noah was a just man, and perfect in his generation, and Noah walked with God. The heart of Asa was perfect all his days. Psalm 119, verses 1 and 10, Genesis 6, verse 9, 2 Chronicles 15, verse 17. Testimonies of a similar character are found in every part of the Scriptures, therefore the works of the saints are perfect. Answer. These and similar declarations of Scripture speak of that perfection which consists in parts, of true sincerity as opposed to hypocrisy and a feigning of piety, and not of that perfection which consists in the degrees of obedience which the saints ought to render to God. For the saints do not in this life attain to that degree of perfect obedience which the law requires, yet they nevertheless have the commencement of perfect obedience to the divine law, and of subjection to God, according to all his commandments. And although there is much hypocrisy and sin still remaining even in the most holy, as it is said, let every man be a liar, Romans 3 verse 4, yet there is, notwithstanding, a great difference between those who are altogether hypocrites, whose hypocrisy is pleasing to themselves, having no commencement or sense of true piety in their hearts, and those who, acknowledging and lamenting the remains of hypocrisy in themselves, have at the same time the commencement of true faith and conversion to God. The former are commended of God, whilst the latter are received into favour, not on account of this commencement of obedience which is in them, but on account of the perfect obedience of Christ imputed unto them. We must therefore add that those who are converted are perfect in the sight of God, not only as it respects the parts of true piety which are all begun in them, but also in the degrees of the true and perfect righteousness of Christ imputed unto them. As it is said, Ye are complete in him. Christ is made unto us of God wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. Colossians 2 verse 10, 1 Corinthians 1 verse 30. But, say our opponents, the Scriptures also attribute the perfection of degrees to the saints, as when it is said, We speak wisdom among them that are perfect be not children in understanding, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 6, chapter 14 verse 20, Ephesians 4 verse 13. But these and similar declarations of Scripture do not mean by the term perfect, such as are absolutely or wholly conformable to the law, but such as have more knowledge, assurance, and readiness, confirmed by exercise, to obey God, resist carnal desires, and to bear the cross, than others who are not so fully confirmed and established in the principles of piety. For so this perfection is elsewhere explained, where it is said, that we be no more children tossed to and fro, and carried about by every wind of doctrine. Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but follow after, that I may apprehend that for which I am apprehended of Jesus Christ." To will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. Ephesians 4 verse 13, Philippians 3 verse 12, Romans 7 verse 18. Hence this perfection is relative, having respect not to the divine law, but to such as are weaker and less confirmed in the faith of the gospel. It is also proper that we should here refer to the passage found in 1 John 4 verses 17 and 18, which our adversaries are wont to bring forward against what we have just said. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because, as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. But John does not mean that our love to God, but his love to us, is perfect, that is, fully expressed and made known unto us by the effects or benefits which God has bestowed upon us in Christ as Paul declares in the fifth chapter of his epistle to the Romans, that the love of God shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us, is the cause why we look for the day of judgment without fear and with assurance, and that we are assured of this love and mercy of God by this sign or testimony, because we are in this life conformed to his image by the Holy Spirit. For we are assured of our justification by our regeneration, not as by the cause of the effect, but as by the effect of the cause, and although regeneration is not perfect in this life, yet, if it be indeed begun, it is sufficient to confirm the truth of our faith to our consciences. 
and indeed that which john adds when he says love casteth out fear is a proof that love is not as yet perfect in us because we are not in this life perfectly delivered from fear of the wrath and judgment of god and of eternal punishment for the fear and love of god which are contrary to each other are here in small degrees in the saints at the same time their fears decreasing and their love and comfort or joy in god increasing until joy gains a complete triumph and perfectly casts out all agitation and fear in the life to come when god shall wipe away every tear objection six david says i have not declined from thy law i have kept thy law i have done judgment and justice judge me according to my righteousness psalm 119 verses 50 and 51 and verse 121 psalm 7 verse 8 therefore the regenerate may declare their good works in the judgment as being perfectly conformable to the divine law answer these and similar declarations do not claim for the saints absolute conformity to the law in this life or else they would contradict those passages which speak of the imperfection of the righteous already referred to but of the righteousness of a good conscience without which faith cannot stand just as a good conscience cannot be without faith as it is said that thou by them mightest war a good warfare holding faith and a good conscience which some having put away concerning faith have made shipwreck one timothy one verses eighteen and nineteen the saints now do not dread to come before the tribunal of God and comfort themselves with a consciousness of having acted correctly, not indeed because they would oppose this to the judgment of God, or because they are conscious of no sin, for they exclaim in view of their sins, O Lord, enter not into judgment with thy servant. If thou, Lord, shouldst mark iniquities, who should stand? But because they have a sincere and not a hypocritical desire to obey God, and have the full assurance that their sins are covered and washed away by the blood of Christ, and that the obedience which is begun in them is pleasing to God for Christ's sake, and that they shall be graciously rewarded by Christ according to the promises of the gospel. Objection 7. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. 1 John 3 verse 9. Therefore new obedience in the saints is perfect and without sin. Answer. But this is to misunderstand the figure of speech which is here used not to commit sin is not according to john to be without sin for this he had taught in the first and second chapters of this same epistle does not take place even in the most holy but it is not to have reigning sin nor to persevere in it which is not inconsistent with true faith and piety in the saints end of section seventy three Section 74 of Commentary on the Heidelberg Catechism by Zacharias Osinus, translated by G. W. Williard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Use of the Law Question 115. Why will God then have the Ten Commands so strictly preached, since no man in this life can keep them? Answer, first, that all our lifetime we may learn more and more to know our sinful nature, and thus become the more earnest in seeking the remission of sin, and righteousness in Christ. Likewise, that we constantly endeavor and pray to God for the grace of the Holy Spirit, that we may become more and more conformable to the image of God until we arrive at the perfection proposed to us in a life to come. Exposition. When we inquire concerning the use of the divine law, it is necessary that we should keep in view the differences of each part of the law. The use of the ceremonial laws of Moses was one that it might serve as a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ and his kingdom. The law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. Galatians 3 verse 24. 2. That it might distinguish the Jewish church from all other nations. 3. That it might be an exercise of piety and a declaration of obedience to the moral law. 4. A confirmation of faith. There were among the ceremonial laws certain sacraments or signs of the covenant and seals of grace as circumcision and the Passover, which declared what benefits God would give to the faithful by the Messiah which was to come. The use of the judicial or civil laws was, one, that they might contribute to the preservation of the mosaic polity, two, that they might be types of the government of the church in the kingdom of Christ, inasmuch as the princes and kings of the Jewish nation were no less than the priests a type of Christ, the high priest and king of the church. These uses, together with the laws themselves, were done away with when the ceremonies of the former dispensation were fulfilled and abrogated by the coming of Christ, and the mosaic polity overthrown by the Romans. The uses of the moral law are different according to man's fourfold state. First, in nature uncorrupted, or not as yet depraved by sin, 
as our nature was before the fall, there are two principal uses of the divine law, one, the entire and perfect conformity of man with God. The mind of man before the fall possessed a perfect knowledge of the law, which produced a conformity and correspondence of all the inclinations and actions with the will of God. Two, a good conscience or a consciousness of the divine favor and certain hope of eternal life. The law, according to the order of divine justice, promises life to those who render a perfect obedience to its requirements, which, if a man do, he shall live in them. Leviticus 18, verse 5. Second, in nature corrupted, and not as yet renewed by the Holy Spirit, there are also two uses of the law, one, the preservation of discipline and external propriety in the church and the world, the law being engraven upon the minds and hearts of all men by God himself, and speaking by the voice of ministers and magistrates, curbs and restrains even the unregenerate, so that they shun those flagrant and open forms of wickedness which are in opposition to the judgment of sound reason, as it utters itself even in persons unrenewed by the Spirit of God, and which must be removed before regeneration. When the Gentiles which have not the law do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing, or else excusing one another. Romans 2, verses 14 and 15. 2. The knowledge of sin. The law accuses, convinces, and condemns all those who are not regenerated, because they are unrighteous before God, and subject to eternal condemnation. We know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore by the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. I had not known sin but by the law, for I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. Romans 3, verses 19 and 20, chapter 7, verse 7. This use of the law, which consists in a knowledge of sin and of the judgment of God against sin, produces in itself, in the unregenerate, hatred of God, and an increase of sin, and if they are reprobate it drives them into despair, as it is said, the law worketh wrath. Sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence, for without the law sin was dead. Romans 4, verse 17, chapter 7, verse 8. This knowledge of sin, however, is by an accident, a preparation to conversion as it respects the elect, seeing that God by this means leads and constrains them to acknowledge their unrighteousness, to despair of any help in themselves, and to seek by faith righteousness and life in Christ the Mediator, if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law, but the scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. Galatians 3 verses 21 and 22. Third, in nature restored by Christ, or as it respects the regenerate, there are many uses of the law. One, the preservation of discipline and outward obedience to the law. For although this use has respect chiefly to the unregenerate, as we have already shown, who do not refrain from sin, from love to God and righteousness, but only from a fear and dread of punishment and shame, as the poet says, O derunt peccare mali forme dine boene, they hate to sin from a dread of punishment, yet in like manner has its use in relation to the godly, because, on account of the weakness and corruption of the flesh, it is useful and necessary even to them that the threatenings of the law and the examples of punishment set before them may keep them in the faithful discharge of their duty. For God threatens severe punishment even to the saints if they become guilty of sins of a shameful and grievous nature. When the righteous turneth away from his unrighteousness and committeth iniquity, he shall die in his sins. Ezekiel 18 verse 24. 2. A knowledge of sin. This use of the law, although it likewise has reference chiefly to the unregenerate, nevertheless belongs to the godly also, for the law is to the regenerate as a mirror in which they may see the defects and imperfections of their own nature, and also leads them to true humility before God, that so they may continually advance in true conversion and faith, and that whilst the renewing of their nature is going forward, they may become more earnest in prayer and supplication, that they may become more and more conformed to God and the divine law. I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Romans 7, verses 22, 23, and 24. 
the declaration of the Apostle Paul that the law is our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ must be understood of both these uses of the law of which we have just spoken, and that in the elect still unregenerate, as well as in those who are already regenerated. To the former it is a preparation to conversion, whilst in the latter it is the carrying forward or increase of conversion, since faith cannot be kindled or remain in the heart unless open and grievous offences, and such as wound the conscience be hated and shunned. Let no man deceive you, he that committeth sin is of the devil. 1 John 3 verse 7. 3. Another use of the moral law is that it may be a rule of divine worship and of a Christian life. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and cause you to walk in my statutes. Psalm 119 verse 105. Jeremiah 31 verse 33. Ezekiel 36 verse 26. This use of the law is peculiar to the regenerate. For although the law be also a rule of life to the unregenerate before their conversion, yet it is not to them a rule of worship and gratitude to God, as in the case of the regenerate. For that the exposition of the law delivered to the church may teach that God is and what he is. 5. The voice of the law sounding in the church is an evident testimony teaching what the true church is and in what true religion consists. It is in the church alone that the law is delivered and taught in its purity and rightly understood, for all other systems of religion have manifestly corrupted it in different ways by approving of manifest errors and heresies which they have mingled more or less with it. 6. It admonishes us of the image of God in man, or, we may say, it is a testimony of the excellency of human nature before the fall and of the original righteousness which was in Adam and is again restored in us by Christ. 7. It is a testimony of eternal life, still future, in which we shall perfectly fulfill the law. The law was given to be observed by man, but it is not observed in this life. Therefore there is another life remaining, in which we shall yield a perfect obedience to the law. 4. In nature perfectly restored and glorified after this life, the law will also have its use, for although the preaching of it and the whole ministry of the church shall then cease, yet there will still remain in the elect a knowledge of the law, whilst perfect obedience to all its demands and full conformity with God will be wrought in them. The law will, therefore, accomplish the same ends in the life to come, when we shall be fully transformed in the image of God that it did in our nature before the fall. The principal arguments of the antinomians, libertines, and other profane heretics of a similar caste who affirm that the law is not to be taught in the Church of Christ. Objection 1. That which cannot be kept is taught to no purpose. The law cannot be kept. Therefore, it is to no purpose that it is taught in the Church of Christ. Answer. There is here a fallacy in urging that as a cause, which is no sufficient reason, for the mere fact that it is impossible for us to render perfect obedience to the law in this infirm state of our being, is not of itself a sufficient reason why the preaching of the law should be regarded as useless in the Church, since there may be, and indeed are, other reasons why it is not only useful but even necessary to teach and enforce the law. For we have already shown that the law accomplishes many objects even in respect to the regenerate. It is not necessary, therefore, that when one end or use of the law is removed, that the others should likewise be removed. If it cannot be perfectly obeyed, it should at least be taught and enforced, that we may be led to acknowledge this imperfection and defect, in order that we may the more ardently desire and seek the remission of our sins, and that righteousness which is in Christ and may the more earnestly strive to reach and attain the mark set before us even our perfection in Christ. We may also reply to this objection that it is of no force, inasmuch as it assumes that to be true generally, which is true only in part, for the law may, to a certain extent, be kept by the regenerate, as we have just shown. Hence the minor proposition, if it be understood generally, is not true. Objection 2. He who commands impossibilities commands things which are not profitable. God commands impossibilities in his law, therefore he commands things which are useless, and so by consequence the law itself is of no use. Answer. This argument is nearly the same as the one we have just answered. We reply, however, to the major proposition that he commands things unprofitable who commands impossibilities, one, if the things enjoined be absolutely impossible, two, if they be always impossible, three, if the command have no other objects than that the things which are enjoined be perfectly complied with, but there are many ends on account of which God commands and enforces the law, and requires that it be taught in the church, as may be seen from the remarks which we have already made upon this subject. There is also here the same error which we noticed in the former objection, 
in regarding that as a cause which is no sufficient reason. Objection 3. We ought not to desire that which God does not desire to give us in this life, and which we cannot obtain. But God does not desire to give us perfect obedience to the law in this life. Therefore it is in vain that we desire it, and strive for it by the doctrine of the law. Answer. We ought not to desire that which God does not desire to give us, unless he commands us to desire it, and there be weighty reasons why we should seek to obtain it. But God commands us to seek and to desire the perfect fulfilment of the law in this life, and that one, because he purposes at length to accomplish it in those who desire it, and to grant it to us after this life, if we here truly and heartily desire it. Two, that we may here make progress in true piety, and that the desire to conform our lives to the requirements of the divine law be daily more and more kindled and confirmed in us. Three, that God may, by this desire of fulfilling the law, exercise in us repentance and obedience. Objection four. Christ is not the lawgiver, therefore his ministers should not teach and enforce the law. Answer. Christ is not the lawgiver, as it respects the principal office of the mediator, but he was and is lawgiver, one, in as far as he is God and the author of the law, together with the Father, two, in as far as it belonged to the mediator to free the law from the errors with which it had been corrupted, and to restore its true sense, not indeed chiefly, but that he might be able to accomplish the principal parts of his office, which are comprehended in the reconciliation and salvation of the human race. We may give the same answer to the objection as it relates to the ministers of the gospel, inasmuch as they are to teach and expound no other doctrine to the church than that which Christ himself delivered. Objection 5. He who makes satisfaction to the law by punishment is not bound to obedience according to the rule the law binds to obedience or punishment, but not to both at the same time. We now make satisfaction to the law by the punishment of Christ, therefore we are no longer bound to obey the law. Answer. We must make a distinction in reference to the major proposition he who makes satisfaction by punishment is not bound to obedience, that is, he is not bound to render the same obedience, for the omission of which he suffered punishment, but after it is made he is bound to yield obedience anew to the law, or to suffer new punishment in case he disobey the law. Again, he who makes satisfaction to the law by punishment which is not his own but another's, and is received into favour by God without his own satisfaction, ought still to render obedience to the law, even though it be not to make satisfaction for his sins, but that he may in this way show his gratitude to his Redeemer. We ought, therefore, since Christ has satisfied for our sins by his death, to feel ourselves bound to render obedience, not indeed for the time past, but for the time to come, and this too for the purpose of showing our gratitude for the benefit of our deliverance. He that is dead is freed from sin. We thus judge that if one died for all, then were all dead, and that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Romans 6, verse 7, 2 Corinthians 5, verses 14 and 15. Objection 6. Christians are not governed by the law, but by the spirit of regeneration, according as it is said, the law is not made for a righteous man. 1 Timothy 1, verse 9. Therefore the law ought not to be taught among Christians. Answer. Christians are indeed not governed by the law, or, in other words, they are not constrained and driven to such a cause of conduct as is right and becoming by the law, and by fear of punishment, as the ungodly are. Yet they are, nevertheless, ruled in this sense by the law, that it teaches them what worship is pleasing to God, and the Holy Ghost likewise uses the doctrine of the law for the purpose of inclining them to true and cheerful obedience. The doctrine, therefore, that we are bound to give obedience to the law remains, although there is no condemnation or constraint as far as Christians are concerned. For to this we are bound, that our obedience be most free and cheerful, we are debtors not to the flesh, to live after the flesh, but to the spirit. The law is not given for a righteous man, that is, to constrain and bind him. Romans 8, verse 12, 1 Timothy 1, verse 9. Objection 7. Ye are not under the law, but under grace. Romans 6, verse 14. Therefore the law does not bind us. Answer. This, however, is to misunderstand the words of the apostle, for the expression, not to be under the law, does not mean that we are not to yield obedience to the law, but that we are freed from the curse and constraint of the law, just as to be under grace is to be justified and regenerated by the grace of Christ. But, say our opponents, those who are bound to obey the law, and yet do not comply with its demands, are subject to condemnation. But we are not exposed to condemnation, for there is no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Romans 8 verse 1. Therefore we are not bound to obey the law. 
We reply that the major of this syllogism is true, one, in case he who is bound to yield obedience to the law be bound to yield it in his own person. But we are bound to yield obedience, and do yield it, not in ourselves, but in Christ. Two, in case he be bound to obey the law in himself always, or at all times perfectly, but we are not bound in ourselves to yield perfect obedience to the law in this life, but only to begin this obedience according to all the commandments of God. In eternal life we shall be bound to a perfect conformity to the law. Objection 8. The law is the letter which killeth, and is the ministration of death and condemnation. 2 Corinthians 3, verses 6 and 7. But there is no condemnation to Christians, therefore the law does not have respect to Christians who are in Christ Jesus. Answer. There is here a fallacy of accident, for the law is not in itself the letter which killeth, since this comes to pass by the fault of men, who, the more clearly they perceive the difference between themselves and the law, the more fully do they give themselves over to despair in reference to their salvation, and are therefore slain by the law. Again, the law alone without the gospel is the letter, that is, it is the doctrine which merely teaches, demands obedience, denounces the wrath of God and death to such as are disobedient, without producing the spiritual obedience which it requires. But when it is joined with the gospel, which is the spirit, it also commences to become the spirit which is effectual in the godly, inasmuch as those who are regenerated commence willingly and cheerfully to yield obedience to the law. The law, therefore, is the letter, one, by itself and without the gospel, two, in respect to those who are unregenerated. On the other hand, the gospel is the spirit, that is, it is the ministration and means through which the Holy Ghost, which works spiritual obedience in us, is given, not, indeed, as though all who hear would receive the Holy Ghost and be regenerated, but because faith, by which our hearts are quickened, so that they begin to yield obedience to the law, is received by it. It does not follow, therefore, that the law is no longer to be taught in the church, for Christ himself says, I am not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it, Matthew 5, verse 17. And Paul also says that we establish the law through faith, Romans 3, verse 31. Christ fulfilled the law in two respects, by obedience and suffering, he was just and holy in himself, and did not violate the law in a single instance, but partly performed in our behalf those things which he was not bound to do, and partly sustained the punishment of the law. He also fulfills the law in us in two ways, by teaching it and granting unto us his spirit, that so we may commence obedience to it, as we proved when speaking of the abrogation of the law. Objection 9. That is not to be taught in the church which increases sin. The law increases sin, Romans 7, verse 8, therefore it is not to be taught. Answer. There is here a fallacy of accident in the minor proposition. The law increases sin by an accident, or on account of the corruption of man, and that in two ways. First, because the nature of man is so depraved and alienated from God, that men do not perform what they know to be pleasing to God. And, on the other hand, what they know to be prohibited by God, that they desire and do with the greatest willingness, Secondly, because it works wrath, when men fret and murmur against God, hate and turn away from Him, and rush into despair according as the law reveals to them a knowledge of their sins, and the punishment which they deserve in consequence thereof. The law in itself produces righteousness, conformity with God, love to God, etc. The law also in itself increases sin, if we understand the word increase in a different sense, viz. that it shows unto us, and brings it to pass, that we acknowledge the greatness and magnitude of our sins, but not that it so increases sin, as that that which in itself is small is made greater and more aggravated. There are, therefore, four terms in this syllogism in consequence of the ambiguity of the word increase in the minor proposition. Objection 10. The law is not necessary to salvation, therefore it should not be taught in the church. Answer. But even though the doctrine of the law is not necessary in order that we may be saved by obedience to it, yet it is nevertheless necessary on account of other causes, as has been already proven. Objection 11. We have all things in Christ according to what is said, and of his fullness have all we received, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And ye are complete in him. John 1 verse 16, Colossians 2 verses 3 and 10. Therefore we must not go back from Christ to Moses, nor is there any need of the law in the church of Christ. Answer. There is here a fallacy of the consequent, which proceeds from a statement of the whole to a denial of a part. The whole wisdom and knowledge or doctrine which has been delivered unto us by Christ is sufficient and necessary for the church. But the moral law is also a part of this doctrine, because Christ does not only command that faith, but that repentance also should be preached in his name. 
Hence the doctrine of the law is not excluded from the perfect wisdom which we have in Christ, but is rather included in it. End of section 74 Section 75 of Commentary on the Heidelberg Catechism by Zacharias Osinus, translated by G. W. Williard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Of Prayer. 45th Lord's Day of Prayer. Question 116. Why is prayer necessary for Christians? Answer. Because it is that chief part of thankfulness which God requires of us, and also because God will give His grace and Holy Spirit to those only who, with sincere desires, continually ask them of Him, and are thankful for them. Exposition. There are many questions which may be agitated in reference to prayer, the chief and most important of which are the following. First, what is prayer? Second, why is it necessary? Third, what are the things necessary to acceptable prayer? Fourth, what is the form of prayer prescribed by Christ? The first and second of these propositions belong to this 116th question of the Catechism, the third to the 117th, and the fourth to the 118th question. First, what is prayer? Prayer consists in calling upon the true God, and arises from an acknowledgment and sense of our want, and from a desire of sharing in the divine bounty, in true conversion of heart and confidence in the promise of grace for the sake of Christ the Mediator, asking at the hands of God such temporal and spiritual blessings as are necessary for us, or in giving thanks to God for the benefits received. The genus or general character of prayer consists in invocation or adoration. Adoration is often used in the sense of the whole worship of God, since we regard Him as the true God whom we worship. Prayer is a species or part of invocation, for to call upon the true God is to ask of Him such things as are necessary both for soul and body, and to render thanks to Him for benefits received. It is here used in the sense of the general character of prayer. There are therefore two species or parts comprehended in prayer, petition and thanksgiving. Petition is a prayer asking of God those blessings necessary both for the soul and body. Thanksgiving is prayer acknowledging and magnifying the benefits received from God, and binding those who receive these gifts to such gratitude as is pleasing to God. Thankfulness in general consists in acknowledging and professing what and how great is the benefit received, and in binding those who are the recipients thereof to the performance of such duties as are mutual, possible, and becoming. It comprehends, therefore, truth and justice. The Apostle Paul, in his first epistle to Timothy, chapter 2, verse 1, enumerates four species of prayer, saying, I exhort, therefore, that first of all supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. The first includes prayers against evil things, the second petitions for good things, the third intercession for others, and the fourth thanksgiving for benefits received and evils warded off. This distinction is drawn from the end or design of prayer. Prayer is also distinguished into public and private prayer from the circumstances of person and place. Private prayer is the intercourse which a faithful soul has with God, asking, alone and apart from others, certain blessings for himself or for others, or giving thanks for benefits received. This form of prayer is not restricted to any particular words or places, for oftentimes the heart, when burdened and distressed, gives utterance to nothing more than sighs and groans, and the Apostle commands that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands. 1 Timothy 2 verse 8. Public prayer is that which, by the use of certain words, is offered up to God by the whole church in the congregation, the minister leading, as it is right and proper that he should, in the public gatherings of the church. Language, or the use of the tongue, is necessary for this form of prayer. Hence Christ said, When ye pray, say, Our Father, etc., it was also chiefly for this that the tongue was made, that God might be praised and magnified by it, and it is out of the abundance of the heart that the mouth speaketh. Lastly, by this others are also invited to praise and worship God. Second, why is prayer necessary for Christians? The reasons on account of which prayer is necessary for Christians are these. 1. The command of God. God has commanded that we call upon Him and desires that we in this way chiefly worship and praise Him. Call upon me in the day of trouble, I will deliver thee. Ask, and it shall be given you. When ye pray, say, Our Father which art in heaven. Psalm 50 verse 15, Matthew 7 verse 7, Luke 11 verse 2. 2. Our necessity and want. We do not obtain the blessings which are necessary for us, except we ask them at the hands of God, for he has promised them to none but such as ask. 
Prayer is therefore just as necessary for us as it is necessary for a beggar to ask alms. The same thing must be understood respecting the necessity of thanksgiving, which is said concerning the necessity of prayer. For without the giving of thanks we lose those things which are given, and do not receive those which are necessary and should be given. And the necessity of both will readily appear, whether we consider the effects or cause of faith, and so also faith itself. Faith is neither kindled nor increased in any one who does not desire or ask it. No one has faith who is not thankful for it, for all those who are possessed of true faith taste the grace of God, and those who have tasted of the grace of God show themselves thankful to God for it, and desire it more and more. The love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. Romans 5 verse 5 the Holy Ghost is also obtained by prayer, for he is given to none except those who seek and desire him. Objection 1. But the wicked receive many of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, who nevertheless do not ask or desire them. Therefore these things are not merely given to such as desire them. Answer. The wicked do indeed receive many gifts, but not such as are principal or peculiar to the elect, as faith, repentance, conversion, remission of sins, and regeneration, and still further the gifts which they do receive do not contribute to their salvation but to their destruction. And should any one reply and say that infants do not desire the Holy Ghost, and yet receive him, so that he must be given to more than those who ask and desire, we answer that the Holy Ghost is not given to any, except such as desire him, which is to say, to adults who are capable of asking and seeking him. And yet even infants desire the Holy Ghost after their manner, in that they have, in possibility, an inclination to seek him just as they, according to their manner, believe, or have an inclination to faith. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength. Psalm 8 verse 2. Objection 2. The effect is not prior to its own proper cause. Prayer is the effect of the Holy Ghost, inasmuch as no one who does not possess the Holy Ghost can desire him, and he alone indicts prayer within us. Therefore the Holy Ghost is not received by prayer, but is in us before we give utterance to prayer, and is consequently given not merely to such as desire him. Answer. The effect is not prior to its own cause in order and nature, but in time they both exist together. So the Holy Ghost and our desiring him are both in us at the same moment in respect to time, although it is different according to nature. For the Holy Ghost is in us according to nature before we give utterance to prayer, inasmuch as we then for the first time begin to desire him and to ask him of God when he is given unto us, but according to time he is simultaneous with our prayers. For we begin to desire the presence of the Holy Ghost as soon as he is given unto us, and he is also given just as soon as he is desired and sought. Or in other words, God effects in us a desire of the Holy Ghost, and gives him unto us in the very same moment. Yea, it may be said that he produces in us a desire of the Holy Ghost by commanding us to pray for him, and in producing this desire he at the same time gives him unto those who ask and desire him. God does not so work in us, therefore, as when a ray of the sun falls upon a vessel, because the Holy Ghost is a gift of such a character that he is given, received, and prayed for at one and the same time. We might also make a distinction between the beginning and increase of the Spirit within us, inasmuch as we do not desire the latter before we have the former. No one desires the Holy Ghost except he in whom the Spirit dwells, but the first solution or answer which we have given must suffice. For that which Christ says in Luke 11 verse 13, How much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? is not to be understood merely of the increase, but also of the beginning of the gifts and graces of the Holy Spirit. Question 117. What are the requisites of that prayer which is acceptable to God, and which he will hear? Answer. First, that we from the heart pray to the one true God only, who hath manifested himself in his word, for all things he hath commanded us to ask of him. Secondly, that we rightly and thoroughly know our need and misery, that so we may deeply humble ourselves in the presence of his divine majesty. Thirdly, that we be fully persuaded that he, notwithstanding that we are unworthy of it, will, for the sake of Christ our Lord, certainly hear our prayer, as he has promised us in his word. Question 118. What hath God commanded us to ask of him? Answer. All things necessary for soul and body, which Christ our Lord has comprised in that prayer he himself has taught us. Exposition. The conditions of acceptable prayer are 1. 
that it be directed to the true God, or that the true God be called upon who has revealed himself in the church by the word delivered by the prophets and apostles, and by the word of creation, preservation, and redemption. This true God now is the eternal Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Quote, as we have received, said Basil, so have we been baptized, and as we have been baptized, so do we believe, and as we believe, so do we worship the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. End quote. 2. The second requisite of acceptable prayer is a knowledge of the divine commandment. Without the commandment of God, we doubt in regard to our being heard. The person, however, that has an eye to the divine command rests fully assured that his prayers are acceptable to God, because the worship which God requires of us in his word cannot be otherwise than pleasing to him. When we pray, therefore, we ought so to think and resolve, I called upon thee because thou hast commanded me. 3. A knowledge of the things which we ought to ask at the hands of God is also necessary to effectual prayer. God does not desire us to direct vague and wandering petitions to himself, being uncertain what we would pray for. A king would consider himself derided and mocked if any one were to kneel before him without knowing what to ask at his hands. So God will have us consider and think what things we should ask of him if we would pray unto him and not mock him when we come into his presence. We, however, do not know what we should ask. It is for this reason that Christ has prescribed a form of prayer which contains the sum and substance of the things which we should pray for. To sum up the whole in as few words as possible, we would say we should pray for things which we are certain are approved of by God and promised. These consist of two kinds, such as are spiritual and temporal, both of which God desires us to ask at his hand. Spiritual things, because they are necessary to our salvation, and temporal things, one, that the desire of them may exercise our faith and confirm our confidence in regard to our obtaining such things as are spiritual. The reason is because no one can expect good things of God except he be reconciled to him. 2. That we may consider and reflect upon the providence of God, knowing that these small and comparatively unimportant things do not come fortuitously. 4. There must be a true desire for those things which we ask of God if our prayers are heard. God will not have our prayer to be feigned or hypocritical. They must come from the heart and not merely from the lips. God wills us to pray with an earnest desire of the heart, for it is not the words of the mouth but the sighs and groans of the heart that constitute true prayer. As the Lord said unto Moses, Wherefore criest thou unto me? When Moses nevertheless said nothing. Exodus 14 verse 15 Hence an ardent desire is to be made the general and chief thing in the definition of prayer. 5. A knowledge and sense of our own want. This should be the spring or fountain from which all our desires should proceed, for what any one does not feel himself greatly in need of, that he will not ardently desire. All of us now stand in need of God. 6. True humility with an acknowledgment of our want. We should cast ourselves before the Divine Majesty as humble suppliants. God is under no obligation to us. All of us, too, were the enemies of God before our conversion. God now does not hear sinners, that is, such proud sinners as the Pharisee was, who prayed standing in the highest seat in the temple. Hence true humility, penitence, and conversion are necessary to acceptable prayer. The promises of God, too, have respect merely to such as are converted. No one can pray in faith without conversion to God, and without faith no one can have any assurance of being heard, nor does he receive what he desires. 7. A knowledge of Christ the Mediator and trust in Him are likewise necessary in order that we may rest assured that both we and our prayers please God, not on account of any worthiness on our part, but only for the Mediator's sake. It was in this way that Daniel prayed and asked to be heard for the Lord's sake. Daniel 9 verse 17. Christ also commands us to pray to the Father in His name. Our prayers should be placed upon our altar, even Christ. So shall they be acceptable to God. 8 confidence of being heard. As it respects the former condition, faith is necessary in order that we may be fully persuaded that we are just before God, and that he is reconciled to us in Christ. Here, faith or confidence of being heard is necessary, inasmuch as this cannot exist independent of the former. Because ye are sons, God hath put forth the Spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father, Without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Galatians 4 verse 6, Hebrews 11 verse 6. We must, however, here observe in respect to this confidence of being heard, that there is a difference in the things which are to be prayed for. 
some gifts are necessary to salvation, as are those which are spiritual, whilst there are others, such as are temporal, without which we may be saved. The former are to be simply and positively desired with full confidence that we shall as certainly receive them, as we ask them specially at the hands of God. The latter are indeed to be sought and desired, but with the condition of the will of God, that he will confer them upon us if they contribute to his glory and are profitable to us, or that he will confer upon us other and better things, either now or hereafter, as may seem best in his sight. We should, in praying for these things, imitate the example of the leper who said, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. Matthew 8 verse 2 It is in this way that the faithful present their prayers before God and desire to be heard, inasmuch as we oftentimes pray for things which perhaps be more injury than advantage to us if God were to hear and grant our requests. Objection. He who asks doubtingly does not in faith and is not heard. We seek temporal things with doubt inasmuch as we pray for them conditionally, therefore we do not ask them in faith. Answer. The major proposition is either particular or else is not true. For the nature of faith does not depend that we be fully assured in reference to temporal blessings, but merely in reference to spiritual blessings, such as the forgiveness of sins and eternal life, which are necessary to salvation. Respecting temporary benefits, it is sufficient if faith submit itself to the word of God, and to desire and pray for such things as are profitable for us. We also deny the truth of the minor proposition, for, although we do pray conditionally for temporal blessings, yet we do not simply doubt in regard to our obtaining them. We believe that we shall obtain from God the temporal blessings which we ask at his hand, if they contribute to our salvation, and do not desire to be heard if they would be injurious to us. We therefore, notwithstanding, ask in faith, when we submit to the word of God and acquiesce in his will, and pray to be heard according to the good pleasure of our Heavenly Father. For faith submits itself to every word and desire of God, but the will and pleasure of God consist in this, that we desire and pray for spiritual things simply, and for temporal things conditionally, and that we be fully persuaded that we shall receive the former particularly, and the latter in as far as they contribute to the glory of God and our salvation. Praying in this way we do not doubt in regard to our being heard. 9. A knowledge of the divine promise with confidence in it. God promises that he will hear those who call upon him observing the conditions which we have now specified. Call upon me in the day of trouble, I will deliver thee. And it shall come to pass, that before they call I will answer, and while they are yet speaking I will hear. Psalm 50 verse 15, Isaiah 65 verse 24. Without this promise that we shall be heard in what we ask of God, there is no faith, and without faith prayer is of no avail. Except we have faith in the divine promises, and have a regard to them in our prayers, they will not avail us anything, neither can we desire anything with a good conscience. Confidence in the divine promise produces an assurance of being heard, and of our salvation, which assurance kindles in us a desire of calling upon God, and of making supplication to Him. From the conditions which we have specified as being necessary to constitute acceptable prayer, it readily appears what a great difference there is between the prayers of the godly and the ungodly, the godly desire to observe all these conditions in drawing near to God in prayer. The ungodly, on the other hand, either neglect all of them, or else they observe one or two of these conditions, and fall short as it respects the rest. Some commit an error, as it were, in the very threshold, having an incorrect knowledge of the nature and will of God, and so violate the very first condition necessary to acceptable prayer. Some err in things which they pray for, in that they pray for things that are evil, uncertain, and not approved of by God. Some ask blessings of God hypocritically, some ask without any consciousness or sense of the want of the blessings for which they pray. Some have no confidence in Christ the Mediator, some ask that they may be heard in the things which they pray for, and yet persist in sin. Some ask things necessary for salvation, and yet do it with distrust. Some others again address prayers to God, and yet never think of the divine promise, and therefore ask without faith, and so receive no answer to their prayers. Question 119. What are the words of that prayer? Answer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever. Amen. Exposition. 
The form of prayer prescribed by Christ is recited by two of the evangelists, Matthew and Luke. It is, without doubt, the best and most expressive and perfect form of prayer that ever has been delivered. It was delivered by Christ, who is the wisdom of God, and whose words were always heard and answered by his heavenly Father. It also contains, in the most condensed form, all things which are to be sought as necessary for soul and body. It is, in like manner, a rule or pattern with which all our prayers ought to conform and agree. It is sometimes asked, are we so bound down to this form of prayer as not to be permitted to use other and different words when we pray? We reply to this question that Christ delivered this form, not that we should be restricted to these words, but that we might know what things we should ask of God, and how we should ask them. It is a general form respecting the manner and the things which we should pray for. It is likewise frequently the case that there are particular benefits necessary to us, which we should particularly ask of God, according as it is said, Whatsoever ye shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it you. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. Pray ye, that your flight be not in the winter. John 16, verse 23, James 1, verse 5, Matthew 24, verse 20. But these things are not to be found in this prayer, as far as the words are concerned. There are also many examples of prayers, both in the Old and New Testament, which, as to the words at least, are different from this prayer, as the prayers of Jehoshaphat, Solomon, Daniel, of Christ himself, of the apostles, etc. 2 Chronicles 20, verse 6, 2 Kings 8, verse 15, Daniel 9, verse 4, John 17, verse 1, Acts 4, verse 24. These prayers, too, were heard and answered of God. It follows, therefore, that this form of prayer prescribed by Christ is a thing indifferent, in as far as it respects the words. Objection 1. But we must not pretend to be wiser than Christ. Therefore, since he has prescribed a certain form of prayer for us, we should be satisfied with it, and are chargeable with doing wrong whenever we use other forms of prayer. Answer. We should indeed do wrong in departing from this form of prayer, if Christ had intended to restrict us to its use. But he did not design to restrict us to the very language of this prayer, for his purpose was, when he gave this form to the disciples, and taught them thus to pray, to give them a summary of the things which we should ask of God in our prayers. Objection 2. That should be retained than which no better can be invented, but it is not possible for us to invent any better form of prayer, nor to select more suitable words than we find in the Lord's Prayer. Therefore we should retain both the form and the words of Christ. Answer. We cannot invent a better form, nor more suitable words for the purpose of expressing the same summary, which is, as it were, the general of all those things which we ought to seek in prayer. These kinds or classes of benefits which Christ has prescribed in this form of prayer, as the ones to be prayed for, cannot be presented in a better form. But then Christ will have us to descend into particulars, and to pray for special benefits according to our necessity. The form which Christ has prescribed is nothing else than a series of certain classes or heads under which may be comprehended and referred all spiritual and temporal blessings necessary for us. Hence, when Christ commands us to pray for these general benefits, he at the same time commands us to pray for every special benefit included in that which is general. And still further, those things which are here expressed generally, we ought to specify particularly that we may in this way be led to a consideration of our necessity and to a desire of asking God to help us in our necessity. But it is necessary, in order that we may do this, that we should have special forms of prayer, for the explanation of that which is general by that which is special necessarily requires other forms of expression. Hence Augustine declares that all the prayers of the saints which we have in the Scriptures are contained in the Lord's Prayer. Augustine also adds that we are at liberty to express the same things in other words when we pray, but are not allowed to pray for things different from those comprehended in this prayer. 46th Lord's Day Question 120 Why hath Christ commanded us to address God thus, our Father? Answer That immediately, in the very beginning of our prayer, he might excite us in a childlike reverence for and confidence in God, which are the foundation of our prayer, namely that God is become our Father in Christ, and will much less deny us what we ask of him in true faith, than our parents refuse us earthly things. Exposition. The Lord's Prayer consists of three parts, a preface, petitions, and a conclusion. The preface is contained in the words, Our Father, which art in heaven. This again consists of two parts, a calling upon the true God contained in the words, Our Father, and a description of the true God expressed by the words, Who art in heaven. 
Christ will have us to pray in this way, because God desires to be called upon with due honor, which consists, one, in true knowledge, two, in confidence, three, in obedience. Obedience comprehends true love, fear, hope, humility, and patience. Our Father. God is our Father, one, in respect to our creation, which was the Son of Adam, which was the Son of God. Two, in respect to our redemption and reception into divine favor through Christ our Mediator, Christ is the only begotten and natural Son of God. We are by nature the children of wrath and are adopted as children by God for Christ's sake. 3. In respect to our sanctification or regeneration by the Holy Spirit. Christ will have us call God Father, and so to address Him, 1. That we may direct true prayer to God, who is the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. 2. On account of true knowledge, that we may know and acknowledge him to be our Father, who, for the sake of the Son of God, our Mediator, adopted us as his children, when we were his enemies. I ascend unto my Father and your Father. John 20, verse 17. This same God also regenerates us by the Holy Ghost, and confers upon us all necessary good. 3. On account of reverence, or that we may be led to cherish true reverence towards God, for since he is our Father, we therefore conduct ourselves as it is proper for children to do and cherish such reverence for him as children ought to have for a father, especially those who have been adopted and are undeserving of the benefits of God. 4. On account of confidence, or that we may have such a confidence wrought in us as that by which we may be assured of being heard, and that God will grant us all things which pertain to our salvation, for since God, whom we call upon, is our Father, and loved us so greatly as to give his only begotten Son to die for us, how shall he not with him give us all things necessary to our salvation? Romans 8, verse 32. 5. For a remembrance of creation. God now will hear none but those who thus pray unto him, because it is in them only that he obtains the end of his blessings. Objection 1. We call upon the Father according to the command of Christ, therefore we are not to call upon the Son and Holy Ghost. Answer. We deny the consequence which is here drawn, for it is no just conclusion which infers that certain attributes are withdrawn from the other persons of the Godhead when they are attributed to one of the persons. Again, the name of the Father, as the name of God, when it is opposed to creatures must be understood essentially, and when it is used in connection with the other persons of the Godhead, it must be understood personally. The name Father must, therefore, here be understood essentially, the reasons of which are evident, one, because the name of Father is not here put in opposition to the other persons of the Godhead, but in opposition to creatures by whom he is called upon. It is in this way that Christ is called by the prophet Isaiah, the everlasting Father, Isaiah 9, verse 6, two, because when one of the persons of the Godhead is named, the others are not excluded when mention is made of their external operations or works. 3. We cannot think of God the Father and draw near to Him except in His Son, our Mediator. The Son has also made us the sons of God by the Holy Spirit, who is for this reason called the Spirit of Adoption. 4. Christ commands us to call upon Him likewise, saying, Whatsoever ye shall ask the Father in my name, He will give it you. John 16, verse 23. 5. Christ gives the Holy Ghost. It is therefore He Himself from whom we are to ask the Holy Spirit. Objection 2. Christ is called and is our brother. Therefore, he is not our father. Answer. He is our brother in as far as he is man, and our father in as far as he is God, our creator and redeemer. He is the everlasting father. Isaiah 9 verse 6. Objection 3. He who receives us into favor for Christ's sake is not Christ himself. But the father, whom we here so call, receives us into favor for Christ's sake. Therefore, he is not Christ. Answer. He who receives us into favor for Christ's sake is not Christ himself, viz. in the same respect. Christ, as mediator, is he on account of whom we are received into divine favor, but as God he is the person who receives us. Our Father. Why does Christ direct us to say our Father and not my Father? He does this, one, that he may excite in us a confidence of being heard, for since we do not pray alone, but seeing that the whole church unites its voice with ours, God will not reject the prayers of the whole church, but hears them, according as it is said, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. But someone may perhaps be ready to say, it is often the case that Christians pray at home when the church is ignorant of it. But then Christians and the whole church always pray for themselves and for all the members with desire and affection. 
love is an habitual quality abiding even when we are asleep and is not an affection or passion quickly passing away hence when any one prays alone in his closet the whole church prays with him in affection and desire two that he might admonish us to mutual love christians possessing mutual love should pray one for another it is for this reason that christ by placing the word our in the very commencement of this prayer would admonish us of the duty of cherishing mutual love one because where there is no true love to our neighbour there is no true prayer neither can we have any assurance that god will hear us for if we come into the presence of god having no regard for our brethren the sons of god he will not regard us as his sons two because where there is no love to our neighbour there is no faith and without faith there is no prayer for whatsoever is not of faith is sin romans fourteen verse twenty three objection it belongs to a father to withhold nothing from his children but god withholds many things from us therefore he is not our father answer it belongs to a father to grant his children everything necessary and proper for them and to withhold from them whatever is unnecessary useless and hurtful it is in this way that god deals with us giving us all good things temporal and spiritual which are necessary and profitable and contribute to our salvation question one hundred and twenty one why is here addeth which art in heaven answer lest we should form any earthly conceptions of god's heavenly majesty and that we may expect from his almighty power all things necessary for soul and body exposition the second part of the preface of the lord's prayer is contained in the words who art in heaven that is heavenly the term heaven as here used signifies the abode or habitation of god of the holy angels and blessed men concerning which god says in the prophecy of isaiah heaven is my throne and of which christ says in my father's house are many mansions isaiah sixty six verse one john fourteen verse two god is indeed everywhere by his immensity but he is said to exist and to dwell in heaven because he is there more glorious than in the world and there manifests himself immediately christ now commands us to address god as our father who art in heaven one that he might show what a contrast and difference there is between earthly parents and his father or that he might separate him from earthly parents and that we might regard him as such a father one who is not earthly but heavenly dwelling gloriously in heaven two who rules everywhere with heavenly glory and majesty presides over all things and who governs by his providence the whole world which he himself created three who is free from all manner of corruption and change four who even there that is in heaven manifests himself gloriously to angels and declares what a father he is how good how great and rich two that he might excite in us a confidence that god hears us because if he is our father and is possessed of infinite goodness which he especially displays in heaven then he will also give us all things necessary for our salvation and if this our father be also lord in heaven and possessed of infinite power so that he can help us in our need then he can also easily grant unto us what we ask at his hands three that he might excite in us reverence for since our father is so great a lord even one that is heavenly who rules everywhere and has power to cast both soul and body into hell we ought to reverence him and come into his presence with the greatest humiliation of soul and body four that we may call upon him in fervency of spirit five that the minds of all those who worship him may be elevated and fixed upon heavenly things six that we may be led to desire heavenly things seven that we may not fall into the error of the heathen who imagine that god can be adored and worshipped in creatures eight that we might be admonished not to direct our prayers to any particular place as under the old testament end of section seventy five section seventy six of commentary on the heidelberg catechism by zacharias Asinus translated by g w williard this librivox recording is in the public domain the first petition forty seventh lord's day question a hundred and twenty two what is the first petition answer hallowed be thy name that is grant us rightly to know thee and to sanctify glorify and praise thee in all thy works in which thy power wisdom goodness justice mercy and truth are clearly displayed and further also that we may so direct and order our lives our thoughts words and actions as that thy name may never be blasphemed but rather honoured and praised on our account 
exposition. The second part of the Lord's Prayer now follows, containing six petitions. The petition, Hallowed be thy name, is placed first in order, because it comprehends the end and design of all the rest, inasmuch as the glory of God should be the end of all our affairs, actions, and prayers. The end, too, is the first thing in the thoughts and intention of any one, and the last in execution. Therefore the end of the other petitions should be sought in the first place, if we would seek them aright, according to the command of Christ, Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and his righteousness, and all other things shall be added unto you. Matthew 7, verse 33. We must consider, in reference to this petition, first, what is the name of God, second, what is holy, and what is it to hallow the name of God? First, what is the name of God? The name of God signifies one, God himself. Let them that love thy name be joyful in thee. I will sing praise to thy name. I will call upon the name of the Lord. I purpose to build an house unto the name of the Lord my God. Psalm 5 verse 11, 9 verse 2 and 11, 116 verse 13, 1 Kings 5 verse 5. 2. The attributes and works of God. The Lord is his name. The Lord, whose name is Jealous. Exodus 15 verse 3, 34 verse 14. 3. The command, will, and authority of God. I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. 1 Samuel 17 verse 45, Matthew 28 verse 19. 4. The worship, trust, praise, and profession of God. I am ready not to be bound only, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. Be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. In which place, as also in Matthew 28, verse 19, the name of God signifies both the command and profession of God. Acts 21, verse 13, chapter 2, verse 38. Here, the term is to be understood according to the first and second signification, as being taken for God himself, and for all his attributes and works in which his majesty shines. Second, what is holy and what to hallow. The term holy signifies one, God himself, who is most holy and pure, or it signifies essential and uncreated holiness which is God himself, for all the virtues and properties of God constitute his essential holiness. So the angels exclaim in reference to God, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, Isaiah 6, 3. 2. The holiness which is in creatures, which consists in their conformity with God, which, as it respects the godly, is merely begun, but is perfect in the angels. 3. The setting of anything apart to a holy use. In this sense, whatever is consecrated to a sacred purpose is called holy, as the temple in Jerusalem, the altar, the vessels, the priests, etc., etc. The word to sanctify or hallow has these three significations. First, to hallow or to sanctify means to acknowledge, to reverence and praise that as holy which is already in itself holy. In this sense of the term, we are said to sanctify God, who is holiness itself, one, when we acknowledge him to be such as he has revealed himself in his word and works, or when we know and think concerning his essence, will, works, omnipotence, goodness, wisdom, and all his other attributes, what he commands us in his word to know and think respecting them. Two, we do not only acknowledge God to be holy, but also profess and praise him, and that by our words and confession, as well as by our actions and purity of life. 3. When we refer the true doctrine, knowledge, and profession of the holiness of God, together with all our praises and actions, to the end to which God will have them referred, which is to his glory and praise. Secondly, to sanctify is to separate that which in itself is not holy from all uncleanness and make it holy. It was in this way that the word sanctified that nature which he assumed, which in us is corrupt and unholy, preserving it in himself from all the contagion of sin, and at the same time adorning it with perfect holiness. So also God and Christ sanctify the church, by remitting unto us all our sins, and sanctifying us by the Holy Spirit, and at the same time keeping us in the enjoyment of this pardon and holiness. So we are commanded to sanctify ourselves, which is to keep ourselves from all the filthiness of the flesh. Be ye holy, for I am holy. 1 Peter 1 verse 16. Thirdly, to sanctify is to ordain and to direct to a holy end that which in itself is either holy or indifferent. 
It was in this way that the father sanctified the son, that is, he ordained him to the office of a mediator, and sent him into the world. So God sanctified the Sabbath day, the temple, the sacrifices, the priests, etc. Christ also sanctified himself in this way for his people, that is, he offered himself a sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. It is in this way also that bread is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. Of these significations, the first and second are here in point, for when we pray, Hallowed be thy name, we do not merely desire that the name of God be hallowed by us, but also in us, or in other words, we desire, one, that God would enlighten us with the knowledge of his holiness and most holy name, or in the language of the Catechism, we desire that God will grant us rightly to know him, and to sanctify, glorify, and praise him in all his works, in which his power, wisdom, goodness, justice, mercy, and truth are clearly displayed. Two, that his name may be sanctified in us, and that he would regenerate us and make us more and more holy, so that in our whole life we may prevent his most holy name from being blasphemed, and may magnify and declare it with honour and praise in every conceivable way. In a word, we desire, one, that God would enlighten us with the true knowledge of his holiness, two, that he would grant us true faith and repentance, and renew us by his Spirit, that we may be holy as he is holy. 3. That he would give us a disposition to profess this holiness of his divine name in word and deed, to his own praise and glory, that we may in this way glorify him by acknowledging and professing him, and by conforming our lives to his holy will, so as to distinguish him from all idols and profane things. Objection 1. That which is holy in itself cannot be sanctified. The name of God is holy in itself, therefore it cannot be hallowed. Answer. It cannot be sanctified according to the second signification of the term, as above explained, but it may be sanctified according to the first and third signification of the term, according to which that which is holy or indifferent in itself may be acknowledged, praised and celebrated, and directed to a holy end. It is in this way now that we desire the name of God to be hallowed, that that which is holy in itself may also be acknowledged and praised as holy. God sanctifies us by making us holy. We, on the other hand, sanctify God, not by making him holy, but by declaring and acknowledging concerning him what he desires us to know and declare. Objection 2. We ought not to desire another to do for us what belongs to us to do. We now ought to sanctify and hallow the name of God, therefore we should not desire that God would hallow his name, for in so doing we seem to act like a scholar, who, being commanded by his preceptor to apply himself diligently to his studies, desires his preceptor himself to do it for him. We reply to the major proposition by making a distinction. We should not desire another to do what is devolving upon us, provided we have the ability of ourselves to do it. But what we are unable of ourselves to perform, that we properly desire God to grant us the ability to do. But we cannot of ourselves sanctify and hallow the name of God, Therefore we must needs pray to God to grant unto us the strength by which we may hallow the name of God, yea, and that he himself would hallow his holy name in us. End of section 76 Section 77 of Commentary on the Heidelberg Catechism by Zacharias Ursinus, translated by G. W. Williard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Second Petition 48th Lord's Day, Question 123, which is the Second Petition? Answer, Thy kingdom come, that is, rule us so by thy word and spirit, that we may submit ourselves more and more to thee, preserve and increase thy church, destroy the works of the devil, and all violence which would exalt itself against thee, and also all wicked counsels devised against thy holy word, until the full perfection of thy kingdom takes place, wherein thou shalt be all in all. Exposition. Thy kingdom come. The sense is, let thy kingdom grow amongst us and increase by continual advances, and always by new accessions, O God, let thy kingdom which thou hast in thy church be enlarged and multiplied. The questions which chiefly claim our attention in connection with this petition are the following. First, what is the kingdom of God? Second, how manifold is the kingdom of God? Third, who is the head and king of this kingdom? Fourth, who are the subjects of this kingdom? Fifth, what are the laws of this kingdom? Sixth, what are the benefits enjoyed in this kingdom? Seventh, who are its enemies? Eighth, 
Where is it administered? Ninth, how long will it continue? Tenth, how it comes to us? Eleventh, why should we pray that it may come? First, what is the kingdom of God? A kingdom in general is a form of civil government in which some one person possesses the chief power and authority, who, being possessed of greater and more excellent gifts and virtues than others, rules over all according to just, wholesome and certain laws by defending the good and punishing the wicked. The kingdom of God is that in which God alone rules and exercises dominion over all creatures, but especially does he govern and preserve the church. This kingdom is universal. The special kingdom of God, that which he exercises in his church, consists in sending the Son from the Father, from the very beginning of the world, that he might institute and preserve the ministry of the church, and accomplish his purposes by it, that he might gather a church from the whole human race by his word and spirit, rule, preserve, and defend it against all enemies, raise it from death and at length, having cast all enemies into everlasting condemnation, adorn it with heavenly glory, that God may be all in all, and be praised eternally by the church. From this definition we may infer and specify these particular parts of the kingdom of God, 1. The sending of the Son, our mediator, into the world, 2. The institution and preservation of the ministry by him, 3. The gathering of the church from the whole human race, by the preaching of the gospel and by the power of the Holy Ghost, working true faith and repentance in the elect, 4. The perpetual government of the church, 5. The preservation of it in this life, notwithstanding all the fierce assaults of enemies, 6. The casting of all the enemies of the church into everlasting punishment, 7. The raising of the church to everlasting life, 8. The glorification of the church in eternal life, when God will be all in all. Of this kingdom it is said, I have set my king upon the holy hill of Zion. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. My kingdom is not of this world. Psalm 2 verse 6, Psalm 110 verse 2, John 18 verse 36. From these things it is apparent that this kingdom is not a worldly but a spiritual kingdom. This is taught in many of the parables of our Lord, as well as in the declaration which he made to Pilate, saying, My kingdom is not of this world. We are here taught and commanded to pray that this kingdom may come, increase, and be defended. Second, how manifold is the kingdom of God. This kingdom is only one in reality, but differs in the mode of its administration. It is administered differently here from what it is in heaven. It is commonly spoken of and distinguished as the kingdom of grace and of glory. The same distinction is sometimes expressed in this way. The kingdom of heaven is twofold. The one is begun in this life, the other is perfected in the life to come. When we pray, Thy kingdom come, we desire both that it may be established among and in us in this life, and that it may be brought to its highest and ultimate development in the life to come. Yet it is the same kingdom, distinct only by degrees and in the mode of administration. This kingdom, as it exists in this world, has need of means, but in its ultimate state of development there will be no need of means, because the church will then be perfectly glorified and delivered from the evil of guilt and punishment when God shall be all in all. This may be regarded as furnishing an explanation of what the Apostle says in reference to this kingdom, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 24, where he declares that Christ shall deliver up the kingdom to God, even the Father, by which we are to understand that what pertains to the form of the administration of this kingdom, Christ will deliver up to the Father after the glorification of the church, and will then cease to discharge the office of mediator. There will then be no need of conversion, of abolishing of sin, of defense against enemies, of gathering the church, of raising the dead and glorifying them, because the saints will then have been perfected and glorified. Christ will not then teach his people, for they shall all be taught of God. Prophecies shall be abolished, tongues shall cease, and knowledge shall vanish away. For when that which is perfect shall come, then that which is in part shall be done away. The means, therefore, by which the church is now gathered and preserved in the world will then be no longer required. There will then be no enemies to subdue, but the church will reign gloriously with Christ, and God shall be all in all, that is, he will manifest and communicate himself immediately to the blessed. And I saw no temple therein, viz. in this kingdom, in its state of ultimate development, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it, and the city shall have no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten, and the Lamb is the light thereof. 
Revelation 21, verses 22 and 23. Third, who is king and head in this kingdom of God? The head and king of this kingdom is one because there is one God, the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. The Father reigns by the Son and Holy Ghost. Christ is the head of this kingdom in a particular manner, one because he is God, sitting at the right hand of the Father, ruling all things in equal power and glory with the Father. Two, because he is mediator, or that person through whom God the Father works immediately and gives the Holy Spirit. When the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, and gave him to be head over all things to the church. John 15, verse 26, Ephesians 1, verse 22. Fourth, who are the citizens and subjects of this kingdom? The citizens of this kingdom include, one, the angels who are confirmed in holiness, two, the saints in heaven composing what is called the church triumphant, three, the godly or those who are converted and still living in the world, having as yet many cares and remains of corruption, composing what is called the church militant, four, hypocrites who are members merely of the visible church without being truly converted, these are merely apparent citizens, being members of the kingdom of Christ only in name. They are called citizens of this kingdom, as the Jews were called by Christ, the children of the kingdom, Matthew 8, verse 12. Of these persons it will be said, the first shall be last, Matthew 20, verse 16, that is, those who wish to be regarded as the first, and yet are not, shall be last. They shall be declared as such as have no place in the kingdom of God. Fifth, what are the laws of this kingdom? The laws according to which this kingdom is administered are 1. The word of God, or the doctrine of the law and the gospel. 2. The power and efficacy of the Holy Spirit working and reigning in the hearts of the elect by the word. 4. What benefits does the king bestow upon his subjects in this kingdom? There is no kingdom which does not have a regard for the well-being of its subjects. Aristotle, in writing to Alexander, says, quote, A kingdom is not injury or oppression, but bountifulness. End quote. Hence the kingdom of God has, in like manner, benefits peculiar to itself. These are the spiritual and eternal benefits of Christ, including true faith, conversion, the forgiveness of sins, righteousness, perseverance in holiness, the Holy Spirit, glorification, and eternal life. If the Son shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. The kingdom of God is righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. John 8, verse 36, Romans 14, verse 17, John 14, verse 27. Seventh, who are the enemies of the kingdom of God? The enemies of the kingdom of God are the devil and wicked men. Of the latter, some are in the church as hypocrites, who arrogate to themselves the name and title of citizens of this kingdom, whilst they are nothing more than the pretended friends of Christ. Others again are without the church and are its open and avowed enemies, as the Turks, the Jews, the Samosartinians the Arians, and all those who defend errors that subvert the foundation of our most holy religion. Eighth, where is this kingdom administered? This kingdom, as it respects the beginning and gathering of it, is administered here upon earth, yet in such a way that it is not confined in any one particular place, island, province, and nation, but is scattered over the whole world. I will that men pray everywhere. Where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. 1 Timothy 2 verse 8, Matthew 18 verse 20. No one ever falls from or loses his right and title to this kingdom if he continues in true faith. This kingdom is administered in heaven as it respects its complete development. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there shall also my servant be. Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am. We shall be caught up to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. John 14, verse 3, chapter 12, verse 26, chapter 17, verse 24, 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 17. Ninth, how long will this kingdom continue? The gathering of this kingdom continues from the beginning to the end of the world, because there always were, now are, and ever shall be, some members of the true church, whether few or many, who are to be gathered from the world into the kingdom of God. This kingdom will continue in its state of perfection from the glorification of the righteous to all eternity. Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, which, as we have already observed, must be understood respecting the form of the administration of this kingdom. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 24 Tenth, how this kingdom comes to us. This kingdom comes to us in four ways. 
one by the preaching of the gospel which reveals unto us a knowledge of the true and heavenly doctrine two by conversion when some are converted to god who grants unto them faith and repentance three by increase and development when the godly make progress in holiness or when the gifts peculiar to the faithful are continually being increased in those who are converted he that is righteous let him be righteous still and he that is holy let him be holy still revelation twenty two verse eleven four by the perfection and glorification of the church at the second coming of christ even so come lord jesus revelation twenty two verse twenty eleventh why should we desire the coming of this kingdom we ought to pray that the kingdom of god may come both as to its commencement and ultimate development one on account of the glory of god or for the sanctification and hallowing of his name for that we may sanctify the name of god it is necessary that he should rule us by his word and spirit if god does not establish his kingdom in us and rescue us from the kingdom of the devil we will never sanctify his name but rather defile and cast reproach upon it so that this second petition is necessary on account of the first two on account of our comfort and salvation god gives this kingdom to none except those who desire and pray for it just as he gives the holy ghost to none but such as desire him from these things we may readily perceive what it is that we pray for by this petition thy kingdom come we desire and pray that god will by his son our mediator whom he sent into the world from the very beginning one preserve the ministry which he has instituted two that he would collect his church by the ministry of his word and the influence of the holy spirit three that he would rule and govern the church thus gathered and us his members by his holy spirit who may subdue our hearts control and change our wills and conform us wholly to himself four that he would defend us and the whole church against all enemies and tyrants five that he would cast all his and our enemies into everlasting punishment six that he would at length deliver his church and us from all evils and glorify us in eternal life objection but that which our prayers neither hasten nor retard is sought and prayed for in vain the kingdom of god or the deliverance of the church from all the evils and miseries to which it is here subject will not take place sooner or later than god has decreed it therefore it is sought and prayed for in vain answer we deny the major proposition for if this were so we might reason and conclude in the same way in reference to all the benefits which god confers upon us that they should not be sought inasmuch as they are all comprehended in his counsel to this it is replied as follows one but god has promised other blessings with the condition that we should ask them at his hands answer so also deliverance from all evils shall at length reach and be granted only to those in that day who desire and long for it whilst groaning under the cross and who pray that it may come according to the decree of god and that not one of the elect may be excluded two but we ought not to pray that god would hasten the deliverance of the church because this would result in the loss of many of the elect who are not as yet born into the world answer when we pray that god would hasten the deliverance of the church we also pray that all those who are to be brought into the fold of christ may speedily be brought in so that not one may be excluded and this we do one that the church may be speedily delivered and that all the godly may enjoy a full and perfect rest from all their labors and cares two that wickedness and ungodliness of every description may be speedily brought to an end and that all the enemies of christ and his church may be cast into everlasting punishment three that the glory of god may be speedily seen in the perfect deliverance of the church and the rejection of all her enemies we should therefore desire and ask of god in our daily prayers this our deliverance and that also of the whole church if we ourselves would at length be delivered with the church for those who do not desire and pray for the coming of the lord to them he will not come as to his saints end of section seventy seven Section 78 of Commentary on the Heidelberg Catechism by Zacharias Osinus, translated by G. W. Williard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Third Petition. 49th Lord's Day, Question 124, which is the Third Petition. Answer, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That is, grant that we and all men may renounce our own will, and without murmuring obey thy will, which is only good, that so every one may attend to and perform the duties of his station and calling as willingly and faithfully as the angels do in heaven 
exposition. In considering this petition, we must inquire, first, what is the will of God, second, what we desire in this petition, and in what does it differ from the second, third, why is this petition necessary, fourth, why is it added, as in heaven, first, what is the will of God, the will of God signifies in the scriptures, one, the commandment of God, ye ministers of his that do his pleasure, this is the will of God, even your sanctification, Psalm 103, verse 21, 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 3. 2. It signifies the events, or rather the decree of God, respecting future events, in which it is continually revealing and manifesting itself, not my will, but thine be done, my counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. Who hath resisted his will? Luke 22, verse 42, Isaiah 46, verse 10, Romans 9, verse 19. Second, what do we desire in this petition, and in what does it differ from the second? Thy will be done. The senses cause and grant that we may do not our own will, which is corrupt and perverse, but thine, which alone is just and holy, and that we may yield obedience to thee. We desire, therefore, one, a denying of ourselves, which consists in these two parts, one, that we hold ourselves in readiness to give up all our desires and wishes which are in opposition to the law of God, two, that we hold ourselves in readiness to take up the cross, and to submit ourselves willingly to God in all things. In offering up this petition, Thy will be done, we pray, therefore, first of all, that God would bestow upon us His grace, so as to enable us to deny and renounce our own corrupt and perverse will, and be willing to suffer the loss of all things contrary to His will. 2. A cheerful and proper discharge of our duty, that every one in his appropriate sphere may be able to serve God with diligence and to do his will, as well in those duties which are common as in those which are special. Those duties are common which are required not only from us, but also from all Christians, and comprise the virtues necessary for all the godly, as faith, conversion, godliness, charity, temperance, etc. Special duties are those which have respect to our own and to every man's proper calling in life, in praying, therefore, that the will of God may be done, we desire that all these duties may be properly discharged, and that every one may abide in the calling which has been assigned him, and serve God therein, leaving the final issue of events with God, who disposes and directs all things. 3. We desire that such events, as are not contrary to the will of God, and which are pleasing to him, may come to pass. 4. We pray that all our actions and designs may be blessed and prospered, or that God may be pleased out of his infinite good to direct and accompany with his blessing all our actions, counsels, desires, and labors, so that no other events may follow them but such as he knows will most contribute to his glory and our salvation. God wills that we should desire these things from him and leave the final issue of things with himself, we in the meantime properly discharging our duties. To express the whole in a few words, we may say that when we offer up the petition, Thy will be done, we pray that God may, as it were, bury in us all corrupt desires and wishes, and that He alone may work in us by His Spirit, so that we, being sustained by divine grace, may discharge our various duties and carry out the end of our calling. Objection, but the former petition also contains a request that we may rightly perform our duty. Therefore this seems to be superfluous. Answer, we do not here pray for precisely the same thing that we do in the former petition, for in the former we desire that God may commence his kingdom in us by ruling us by his Spirit, who renews our will so that we henceforth, rightly discharging our duty, may render such obedience to our king as becomes subjects of his kingdom. But in this petition we desire that we may all faithfully carry out the will of God respecting us by properly discharging our duties in the different spheres in which we are placed. Or we may express the difference thus, in the former petition, we pray that the church may exist, be preserved and glorified. In this, we ask of God that every one may properly discharge his duty in the church. We may here, as we pass along, notice the connection and difference between the three petitions which we have been considering. The connection between them is of the most intimate character, so much so that no one can exist without the others. The third contributes to the second, and the second to the first, for the name of God is not sanctified unless his kingdom come, nor does the kingdom of God come unless by the use of those means by which it is advanced. These means now are the duties which belong to every man's calling in life. They differ in the following respect. 
In the first we pray for sanctification, or for the true acknowledgement and praise of God, together with all his works and counsels. In the second we desire the gathering, preservation, and government of the church, and that God may rule us by his word and spirit, defend and protect us, and deliver us from all the evils of guilt and punishment. In the third we desire that every one may be diligently engaged in his proper place, direct all that he does to the glory of God, and regard whatever God sends upon him as good and calculated to advance his well-being. Third, why is this petition necessary? This petition is necessary, one, that the kingdom of God may come, which is the thing we pray for in the second petition, for unless God bring it to pass that every one in his own peculiar sphere diligently do his will, this kingdom cannot be established, flourish, and be preserved. Two, that we may be in this kingdom. We cannot be members of this kingdom without doing the will of God. Nor can we of ourselves, on account of the corruption of our nature, do the will of God if he does not give us the necessary strength. This strength now God does not grant unto any except those who desire it. Hence it is necessary that we should pray to God that he may impart it unto us. Objection. It is not necessary that we should desire that which is always done, and which will certainly come to pass, even though we do not pray for it. The will of God is always done, and will most certainly come to pass, even though we do not desire it. Therefore it is not necessary that we should pray that it may be done. Answer. There is in the major proposition a fallacy in regarding that as a cause which is none, for we do not pray that the will of God may be done as if it would not be done, if we did not desire and pray for it, but for other causes, viz. that it may also be done by us, and that the events which God has ordained may contribute to our comfort and salvation. These events will not turn out to our advantage and salvation unless we submit to the will of God, and desire only that to be done which God has decreed and desires to be done. We also deny the minor proposition which is false, one, as it respects the calling of every one, because those who do not desire and pray that they may be able in their appropriate sphere to discharge their duty correctly, faithfully, and with comfort to themselves, never do it. Two, it is also false as it respects the divine decrees, because God has decreed many events, yet in such a way that he has also decreed the means necessary thereto, and should someone reply, the decrees of God are unchangeable, so that the things which he determines upon will come to pass even without our prayers. We answer, the decrees of God are unchangeable, not only as it respects the event or end, but also as it respects the means which lead to this end. God has decreed to give the end, but it is by the means which lead to it, which is with the condition that we desire and pray for it. Fourth, why is it added, as in heaven? Christ adds the clause, as in heaven, for these two reasons, one, that he might set before us an example of perfection, after which we should strive, two, that from the desire of perfection we might be assured that God will here grant unto us the commencement, and in the life to come the consummation of all that we desire in reference to his kingdom and will. To him that hath shall be given, Luke 8, verse 18. The reason of both is this, that in heaven the will of God is done perfectly. Does any one ask by whom? We answer, one, by the Son of God, who does all that the Father wills. Lo, I come, I delight to do thy will, O my God. I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. Psalm 40, verses 7 and 8, John 6, verse 38. Two, by the holy angels and blessed men. The will of God is done in heaven in such a way by the angels that every one of them stands before God ready to do whatever he commands. They do the general and special will of God most promptly and cheerfully. No one declines or refuses to do the service which God requires for them. No one transcends the limits which God has prescribed and in which he requires them to serve him. No one is ashamed to serve us, although we offend them and God by our sins. They are ministering spirits, Hebrews 1 verse 14. It is in this way, therefore, we all desire that we may also obey God and do his will on earth, as the holy angels do it in heaven. Objection. Things which are impossible should not be desired, but to desire that the will of God may be done on earth as in heaven, or that we may discharge our duty as the angels do in heaven, is impossible. Yea, it is to desire and pray for that which is contrary to the will of God. Therefore it is not to be sought, since God designs that this shall be our state in the life to come, and not in the present state of being. Answer. In answering this objection, we would make the following distinction in reference to the major proposition. 
things which are impossible should not be desired, unless God designs to give them at length to those who desire them. But God wills to give the ability to perform obedience to this his will, to such as desire it, in such a way that they commence this obedience in this life, and shall have it perfected in the life to come. The consummation of it is, therefore, to be ardently desired, whilst the impossibility of it should be patiently endured in this life. The consummation of it should also be desired, that we may at length obtain it, since he who does not desire it will certainly never obtain it. It is one thing not to be able to obtain this consummation, and another thing not to desire it. We also deny the minor proposition, in which there is an error in regarding that as a cause which is no cause, for we do not desire and pray that the consummation of our obedience to God may be accomplished in this life, but that we may here have the commencement, the continuation and increase of this obedience in us, and that at length, after it has been gradually carried forward by constant progression and increase, it may be perfected, and that we may then do the will of God as fully and perfectly as the angels continually do it in heaven. Hence, when we pray that the will of God may be done on earth as in heaven, the word as does not refer to and signify the degree, but the kind of obedience here alluded to, viz. the beginning of it, the desire and obtaining of which is not contrary to the divine decree. And as to the consummation of this obedience, it is proper that we should every moment desire and pray that we may be wholly delivered from sin, for it is agreeable to the will of God that we should pray for this, even though he does not design to perfect it in this life. It is not proper for us to search and scrutinize into what God has decreed, when we have this rule prescribed, that we pray for things upon the condition of the will of God. We should therefore submit ourselves to the divine will, and pray for what God has commanded us to ask of him, whether he has decreed it or not. God, for instance, wills the death of our parents, and yet does not design that we should desire and pray for their death. So God also wills that the church should have her seasons of affliction and oppression, but does not desire that we should pray for these afflictions but for her deliverance, or that she may patiently submit to the afflictions which he sees fit to send upon her. So it is now in reference to the subject in hand. God does not design to give us perfect deliverance from sin in this life, and yet he wills that we should desire it and constantly pray that we may be wholly delivered from sin. There are, therefore, some things to be sought and prayed for which God will not bring to pass, and, on the other hand, there are some things which God designs to bring to pass, which we are not to desire and pray for, but patiently to endure, if they do come to pass. And yet in doing this we do not pray contrary to the will of God, because we always submit ourselves to his will in our prayers. End of section 78 Section 79 of Commentary on the Heidelberg Catechism by Zacharias Osinus, translated by G. W. Williard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Fourth Petition. Fiftieth Lord's Day, Question 125, which is the Fourth Petition. Answer, Give us this day our daily bread, that is, be pleased to provide us with all things necessary for the body, that we may thereby acknowledge thee to be the only fountain of all good, and that neither our care nor industry nor even thy gifts can profit us without thy blessing, and therefore that we may withdraw our trust from all creatures and place it in thee alone. Exposition. This petition respecting our daily bread, it would seem, should have been placed after the petition in which we pray for the forgiveness of our sins, inasmuch as such benefits as are most important should be prayed for first, whilst those which are less important should be sought last. But Christ, having regard to our infirmities, placed this fourth petition respecting our daily bread, as it were in the middle of the prayer which he prescribed, that we might both commence and end our prayers with petitions for spiritual blessings as being most important, and that the obtaining and receiving of temporal benefits might confirm in us more and more a confidence of obtaining spiritual blessings. In this fourth petition we are taught to pray for temporal blessings, concerning which we must inquire, first, why temporal blessings should be prayed for, second, in what manner they are to be sought, third, why Christ comprehends temporal blessings under the term bread, fourth, why he calls it our bread, fifth, why he calls it daily bread, sixth, why it should be given daily, seventh, whether it is lawful for us to pray for riches, eighth, whether it is lawful to lay up anything for the time to come. First, why temporal blessings should be prayed for. 
we should desire and pray for temporal blessings from god no less than such as are spiritual one on account of the command of god which of itself should be sufficient even though we should assign no other reason we have as a warrant for asking temporal blessings from god both a general and special command christ gives a general command when he says ask and it shall be given you matthew seven verse seven we have also a special command uttered by christ when he prescribed unto us this form of prayer saying after this manner therefore pray ye in which he also commands us to ask bread or temporal blessings from god when christ therefore commands us to take no thought in regard to what we shall eat and says that all these things shall be added unto us he does not design to forbid us to ask of god our daily bread but condemns distrust or a want of confidence in god matthew five verses thirty one and thirty three two on account of the divine promise god has promised to give us all things necessary for our life and has promised them in order that we might desire and pray for them and that we might have a firm confidence that we shall obtain things necessary for us which confidence is spiritual and not carnal your heavenly father knoweth that ye have need of all these things matthew six verse thirty two three on account of the glory of god this petition for temporal blessings is an acknowledgment and profession of the providence of god especially towards the church god desires that this praise should be given to him inasmuch as he is the source of all good things and that we may not suppose these things to come by mere chance for on account of our comfort that they may be expressions of god's good will towards us since good gifts such as contribute to salvation are promised and conferred only upon the children of god hence when these gifts are conferred upon us we should comfort ourselves by believing that we are of the number of those whom god has promised to grant these things five that the desire and expectation of these blessings may be an exercise of our confidence and hope for we cannot promise to ourselves temporal blessings unless we are assured of spiritual blessings and of god's good will towards us neither can we desire and pray for temporal blessings from god unless we are persuaded that we are in favour with him six on account of our necessity that we may be able to do the will of god on earth this we cannot do without daily bread the dead praise not the lord psalm 115 verse 17 7 that the desire of these things may be a confirmation to us and a profession before the world that it is god who confers upon us even the smallest gifts 8 for this comfort that we may know that the church shall always be preserved on earth since god always hears our prayers and will constantly grant unto us our daily bread according to his promise second in what manner temporal blessings are to be prayed for temporal blessings are to be sought and prayed for as well as other good things promised in the gospel one with confidence in the promise of god or from faith if we offer up our prayers differently they are not heard neither are the good things which we have made contributory to our salvation two with the condition of the will of god that god would give us what we pray for if it be pleasing to him and as he knows they may contribute to our advantage and his glory because he has promised these things not with any determined circumstances god has not prescribed in his word what temporal blessings he will confer upon us it is different however as it respects spiritual blessings for in reference to these god has expressly promised that he will give them to every one that asks three with confidence of being heard so that we believe that god will give us as much as is necessary to meet our wants four to this end that we may in the use of these things serve god and our neighbour and not that they may contribute to our sensual desire those who do not in this way desire these blessings are not heard and although they may receive what they ask yet god does not hear them because the things which they receive are not made profitable for their salvation there are two reasons why god has not specified in his word what temporal blessings he will confer upon us as the salvation of every one and the manifestation of his own glory demands one because we are often ignorant what we should pray for and what would be good for us god knows best what blessings it is desirable that he should confer upon us for the manifestation of his own glory and our salvation as we therefore often err in asking temporal blessings god confers only such upon us as he knows will be profitable for us it is different however as it respects spiritual blessings because these are all profitable unto us and god has prescribed the way in which we are to pray for them so that we cannot err in desiring them for what god has positively promised that we ought to desire positively and what he has specially and simply promised that we should seek and pray for in the same way 
So we should simply desire and pray for the Holy Ghost, because God has simply and expressly promised to give the Holy Ghost to everyone that asks. Two, that we may learn to be contented with those things which we have received from God, and always submit our will to the will of God. Third, why Christ comprehends temporal blessings under the term bread. One, Christ, by a synecdoche which is common in the Hebrew language, comprehends under the term bread, all temporal blessings, and such as are necessary for the sustenance of life, as food, raiment, health, civil peace, etc. This is evident from the design of the petition, for we pray for bread from our necessity, but there are many other things besides bread necessary for us, therefore we pray for them also under the term bread. This synecdoche, so common in the Hebrew language, often occurs in the Bible, as in the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread. He that did eat of my bread hath lifted up his heel against me. Genesis 3 verse 19, Psalm 41 verse 9. Nor did Christ merely comprehend under the term bread things necessary for the sustenance of life, but he also comprises such a use of these things as is profitable. For bread, apart from such use, is no better than a stone. 2. Christ furthermore comprehends all temporal blessings under the term bread, one, that he might restrain our desires and teach us to pray only for such things as are necessary for the support of life and for the service of God and our neighbor, both in our common and proper calling. Two, that he might teach us to pray not only for such things as are necessary, but also that the use of them might be made profitable to us and tend to our salvation inasmuch as these things profit us nothing without such a use. Bread now is made profitable to us, one, if we pray for it and receive it with faith, or with the intention, after the manner and to the end which God directs, which requires that we look in the exercise of faith to God, the author and giver of all good things. Two, if we desire that God will give, with the bread which we receive, the virtue and power of nourishing and preserving our bodies, which requires that we do not merely pray for bread itself, but also for the blessing of God, for if God does not bless us in that which we receive, all our cares and labors are in vain, and the gifts of God themselves are therefore useless and hurtful, according to the threatening, I will break the staff of your bread. Leviticus 26 verse 26. We may now easily see what we desire when we pray for bread, viz. 1. Not great riches, but only such things as are necessary for us. 2. That these things may be to us bread, or may be profitable and salutary, by the blessing of God without which bread is not bread, but becomes, as it were, a stone or poison. For he who gives bread, that it may not profit him that receives it any more than if it were a stone, gives a stone and not bread. Such now are the blessings which the wicked receive from God, and take as it were to themselves. Fourth, why does Christ call it our bread? Christ commands us to pray for our bread, and not for mine or thine, or any other man's, one, that we may desire those things which are given to us of God, for the bread which God gives us as necessary for the support of life is, and is made ours, when it is given unto us. This petition, therefore, give us our bread, signifies, give us, O God, the bread allotted to us, and which thou dost design shall be ours. God, as a householder, distributes to every one his own portion, or that which we deserve at his hands. 2. That we may desire things necessary, acquired by lawful labor in some honest and proper calling, pleasing to God and profitable to society at large, or that we may receive what we ask at the hands of God by ordinary means and lawful ways, the hand of God reaching them to us from heaven. This we command you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good. 2 Thessalonians 3 verse 10, Ephesians 4 verse 28. 3. That we may use them with a good conscience and with thanksgiving, for God desires that we should take unto ourselves the assurance that, when he gives us these things, he also grants unto us the privilege of enjoying his gifts. God desires that we should use his gifts not as thieves and robbers, but cheerfully and with thanksgiving. Fifth, why does Christ call it daily bread? Christ calls the bread which we are commanded to ask of God daily bread, one, because he will have us to ask daily as much as we need for each day, two, because he would restrain our raging and boundless desires. Your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of these things. A little that a righteous man hath is better than the riches of many wicked. There is no want to them that fear him. Matthew 6 verse 32, Psalm 37 verse 16, Psalm 34 verse 9. Hence the petition, Give us our daily bread, means, Give us as much bread as is sufficient for us. 
give us so much of what is necessary for the support of life, as every one of us needs to serve thee and our neighbour in our several callings in life. Sixth, why does Christ add this day? Christ adds the phrase this day, one, that he might meet and guard against our distrust and covetousness, and keep us from both these vices, two, that we might depend upon him alone as yesterday, so this day and to-morrow, and also expect the necessaries of life from the hands of God, that we may know that they are not obtained by our own hands or labour or diligence, but that God confers them upon us, and that we may know that even though we receive them, yet they will not profit our bodies if the blessing of God does not accompany them. 3. That the exercise of faith and prayer may always be continued in us, for as long as it is said this day, so long does Christ design that prayer should be continued, that we may yield obedience to the command to pray always. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 17. Seventh, is it lawful for us to pray for riches? This, in connection with the following question, naturally grows out of what we have already said in reference to this petition, for when we are commanded to pray only for our daily bread, and that to this day, it would seem at first view that it is not lawful either to desire riches or to lay anything by for to-morrow. It is, however, certainly right and proper to desire riches if we remove all ambiguity from the word and understand by it things which are necessary for the support of life. It was in this way also that Epicurus defined riches, quote, to be a poverty adapted to the law of nature, end quote. This is a good definition of the term, for they are to be considered truly rich, who enjoy a sufficient amount of the things necessary for the support of life, and are contented therewith. If we therefore understand the term riches as just defined, they are certainly to be sought and prayed for at the hands of God, inasmuch as we are to desire such things as are necessary for nature, and for the position and office which God has assigned us in life. And the reason is that these necessary things or riches are the daily bread which we are commanded to ask and pray for at the hands of God. There are others, again, who define the term differently, understanding by it an abundance and plenty over and above what is necessary. So Croesus, so named the rich, said, quote, that no one is rich unless he was able to support an army by his revenue, end quote. In this sense, riches are never to be asked of God, seeing that this is not to pray for our daily bread. Solomon says in the person of all the godly, Give me neither poverty nor riches, Proverbs 30 verse 8, by which words the Holy Ghost teaches that riches, when understood to mean an abundance over and above what is necessary, are to be deprecated by us. The declaration of the Apostle Paul in his first epistle to Timothy, chapter 6 verse 9, is also here in point, where he says, they that will be rich fall into temptations and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. Christ also calls riches thorns, which we cannot handle without exposing ourselves to the danger of being pricked thereby, Matthew 13, verse 22. But on the other hand, godliness is great gain if a man be contented with what he has, 1 Timothy 6, verse 6. Should God, however, give us anything besides what is actually necessary for us, we should use these things properly, or reserve them for purposes good and necessary, for Christ commanded the disciples to gather up the fragments, that nothing might be lost. John 6 verse 12. We have also a remarkable example in the person of Joseph, who, being warned of the approaching famine, gathered and laid by provisions, in the time of plenty, for the years of scarcity and dearth which were to come upon the land of Egypt. Genesis 41 verse 48. But here care must be taken, one, that we do not repose our trust in them, if riches increase, set not your heart upon them. Psalm 62, verse 10. 2. That we avoid luxury and every abuse of the gifts of God. 3. We should regard ourselves as stewards of God who has committed these riches to our charge for the purpose of being properly expended, and has imposed upon us the duty of administering them so as to promote His glory, and that we shall at some time be required to render an account to God for our stewardship and administration. 8. Is it lawful for us to lay anything by for the time to come? That it is right and proper for us to lay something by for the time to come may be inferred from the command of Christ, gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. John 6 verse 12. The same thing is also taught by the word our, as it is here used. For we are required to aid and contribute to the support of the commonwealth, and to give to the poor as opportunity presents itself. This, however, we cannot do unless we lay something of our own by, so that we may have something to give whenever any occasion calls for the exercise of our liberality. We may here appropriately refer to all the precepts and rules which the scriptures give respecting parsimony and frugality, 
which virtues are employed in keeping and profitably disposing of things honestly acquired for one's own use and for the benefit of his friends, so as to avoid all sumptuousness, prodigality, luxury, and waste of the gifts of God. The Apostle Paul teaches that it is the duty of parents to lay something in store for their children when he says, The children ought not to lay up for the parents, but the parents for the children, 2 Corinthians 12, verse 14. These three things should, however, be observed in laying up possessions for the time to come. One, that the things which are laid by in store be lawfully gotten, having been acquired by honest and lawful labor. Two, that we do not repose our confidence in them. Three, that they be preserved for lawful and necessary purposes, both as it respects ourselves and others, such as a proper support of our own life and for our families, for the preservation of the church and state, and for administering to the wants of the poor and needy, concerning which we may cite the following passages of Scripture. Trust not in oppression, and become not vain in robbery. If riches increase, set not your heart upon them. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. Psalm 62, verse 11, Ephesians 4, verse 28. We may now easily return an answer to the objections which are brought against this petition. Objection 1. It is not necessary to desire and pray for what is ours. Daily bread is ours, therefore we need not desire it from God. Answer. There are here four terms arising from the ambiguity of the word our, which in the major proposition signifies a thing which we have in our own power, whilst in the minor it signifies a thing which becomes ours by the gift of God, or which we obtain from God by prayer, as we have already shown. Objection 2. It is not necessary that we should labor for that which is obtained not by labor, but by prayer. Our daily bread is obtained not by labor, but by prayer. Therefore, we should not labor for it, but merely pray. Answer. There is here an error in regarding that as absolutely true, which is true only in part. Those things which are simply not obtained by labor, neither as a cause nor as the necessary means, for these it is to no purpose that we labor. But although our labor is not necessary for the purpose of obtaining temporal benefits as the whole or principal efficient cause, yet it is nevertheless necessary as a means instituted by God, according as it is said, In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return to the ground. This we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. Genesis 3 verse 19, 2 Thessalonians 3 verse 10. God gives all things freely, but not without labor and prayer on our part. Objection 3. Christ here commands us to pray for our daily bread, and this day, and not tomorrow. Therefore it is not lawful to lay anything in store for the time to come. Why then does Paul say that parents ought to lay up for their children? 2 Corinthians 12 verse 14. Answer. This objection is of no account, inasmuch as it regards that as a cause which is none. Christ commands us to pray for our daily bread, and this day. Hence we are to ask that which is necessary for every day, this day, tomorrow, and as long as we live. We are, therefore, not to understand Christ as teaching that he will not have us to labor for the morrow, or that we are not to lay anything by for the future, or that we are to cast away those things which God has already given us as sufficient for the time to come, for his object is to remove from us distrust, covetousness, and an unrighteous acquisition of goods and disobedience. He does indeed say, in another place, take no thought for the morrow, Matthew 6, verse 34, but his meaning evidently is that we should not think of the morrow with distrust, as though God would then give us nothing, or as though it would not be necessary for us to pray. He does not, therefore, forbid labor and prayer, but merely distrust and a want of confidence in God. End of section 79《nor that depravity which always cleaves to us, even as we feel this evidence of thy grace in us that it is our firm resolution from the heart to forgive our neighbor. Exposition Cyprian correctly and piously observes, respecting the order and argument of this fifth petition, that we pray for the pardon and forgiveness of our sins after praying for a supply of food, that he who is fed by God may live in God, 
nor do we merely have regard for this present temporal life, but also for that which is eternal, to which all those attain whose sins are pardoned. This same father likewise observes that this petition is a remarkable and free confession of the church in which she acknowledges and deplores her sins, and is at the same time a comfort that the church shall receive the forgiveness of sins according to the promise of Christ, and also binds us to extend forgiveness to our neighbour. Christ, therefore, by this petition, wills, one, that we acknowledge our sins, two, that we thirst and long after the forgiveness of sins, inasmuch as this is granted to none but such as desire it, and who do not trample underfoot the blood of the Son of God, three, that our faith may be exercised, seeing that this petition springs from faith and also confirms faith, for faith is the cause of prayer, and prayer is the cause of faith as it respects the increase thereof. The principal questions which claim our attention in connection with this petition are the following. First, what does Christ mean by debts? Second, what is it to forgive debts or sins? Third, why is the forgiveness of sins to be prayed for? Fourth, how are sins remitted unto us, or what is the meaning of the clause, as we forgive our debtors? First, what does Christ mean by debts? Christ comprises under the term debts all our sins, original as well as actual, including sins of ignorance, of omission and commission, as he himself explains it in Luke 11 verse 4, where he says, Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive every one that is indebted to us. They are called debts because they make us debtors to God, both in respect to the obedience which we have failed to render, and also to the punishment which we are bound to pay in consequence thereof, for when we sin we neither give nor perform to God what we owe him, and as long as we do not yield this to him, so long do we remain debtors to God, and are bound to make satisfaction by punishment. Cursed be he that confirmeth not all the words of this law to do them. Deuteronomy 27 verse 26 from this state of condemnation we could never be delivered if God did not remit unto us our sins. Second, what is it to remit debts or to forgive sins? A creditor is said to forgive a debtor when he does not demand from him that which he owes him, but blots his account from his books without exacting any punishment, as though it had been paid, as we may learn from the parable of the king who in view of the entreaties of the servant that owed him ten thousand talents forgave him the debt, Matthew 18, verse 27. So God forgives our debts when he does not lay them to our account, nor punish us on account of them, and that because he has punished them in his Son, our Mediator. This, therefore, is what we are to understand by the forgiveness of sins, that God does not impute any sin to us, but graciously receives us into his favor, declares us righteous, and regards us as his children out of his mere grace and mercy for the sake of the satisfaction which Christ made in our behalf, imputed unto us and apprehended of us by faith, and that he will therefore not punish us on account of our sins, but grants unto us righteousness and eternal life, since the remission of sin does away with the punishment of sin, for sin and punishment are correlatives. When sin is introduced or committed, punishment follows, but when it is taken away, punishment is at the same time removed. Objection. To remit sin is not to impute it, nor to be willing to punish it in us. But this is inconsistent with the justice of God. Therefore, when we pray that God will remit sin, we desire that he will act contrary to the order of his justice. Answer. We deny the consequence because the order of divine justice is not violated when God pardons sin, except he pardons it without any satisfaction being made. But it is not in this way that we pray for the forgiveness of sins, inasmuch as we desire it on account of the satisfaction of Christ. Hence, when our sins are remitted, there is no wrong done to the order of divine justice, as it is not done without satisfaction having been made. And if some should reply that God does not graciously and freely remit our sins, if he does it in view of a recompense having been made, we answer that they are forgiven in view of a recompense having been made, and therefore not freely in respect to Christ, but freely in respect to us, since he does not receive satisfaction from us, but from Christ. And if it should still further be objected that remission of sins is not granted freely, since we have merited it in Christ, we answer that the merit on account of which our sins are pardoned is not ours, but Christ's, who was given by the Father freely for us, and merited this forgiveness for us without the intervention of any desert on our part, and that this his merit is freely imputed unto us. Hence our sins are graciously forgiven on account of the merit of Christ, from which it is correctly inferred that they are not imputed unto us on account of the satisfaction of Christ. 
for we do not desire that God would act contrary to his justice, and that he would not regard us as sinners, but that he would not impute unto us the righteousness of another, even the righteousness of Christ, with which our sins are covered. To express it more briefly, we would say, God remits our sins freely, one, because he does not demand any satisfaction from us, two, because he freely gave his Son, in whom he made satisfaction, three, because he graciously gives and imputes the satisfaction of his Son to such as believe. Third, why should we desire the forgiveness of sins? We should desire and pray for the forgiveness of sin, one, on account of our salvation, that we may be saved, for without the forgiveness of sins we cannot be saved. Neither does God confer this benefit upon any but such as desire it. Two, that we may be admonished and reminded of the remains of sin which still cleave even to the most holy in this life, and that our repentance may thus become more earnest and deep. Three, that we may desire and receive the former blessings, because, without the remission of sins, these blessings are either not given, or else they are given to their destruction. So the wicked often receive these gifts, but not to their salvation, for they rather contribute to their condemnation. Objection. It is not necessary that we should desire and pray for what we have. The godly have the remission of their sins, therefore there is no need that they should desire it. Answer. The godly do indeed enjoy the forgiveness of sins, but not wholly, and that too not in respect to the continuance, but merely as it respects the beginning thereof. This forgiveness should without doubt be continued, inasmuch as sins are continually found even in the regenerate. God does also continue it in all those to whom he forgives sin in his Son, but with the condition that we daily desire this continuance. Hence, although God has forgiven our sins for Christ's sake, yet he nevertheless designs that we should pray for their forgiveness. It is for this reason that we pray that God would forgive us the sins which we now or may hereafter commit. Fourth, how are sins remitted unto us, or why is it added, as we forgive our debtors? Our sins are so remitted unto us, as we also forgive our debtors, which clause is added by Christ, one, that we may rightly desire and pray for the forgiveness of our sins, and may therefore come before God in true faith and penitence, the sign of which is love to our neighbour. Two, on account of our comfort, that we may be assured of the forgiveness of our sins, when we extend forgiveness to others for the sins which they may have committed against us, and may have the assurance that we are acceptable to God, although there are many remains of sin still within us. Objection 1. He is not pardoned who himself does not forgive. We do not forgive, therefore we are not forgiven. Answer. He who does not forgive fully and perfectly does nevertheless obtain forgiveness if he does but forgive truly and sincerely. Therefore forgiveness shall also be extended to us if we forgive truly and sincerely. Objection 2. Christ commands us to pray that God will forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. But we do not perfectly forgive our debtors. Therefore we, according to this petition, pray that God will not perfectly forgive us our sins, which is to desire our destruction, since God will condemn even the smallest sin. Answer. This is to put a false construction upon the words of Christ, for the particle as, as used in this petition, does not signify the degree of forgiveness, or teach that the forgiveness which we extend to others is equal to that which God extends to us, but it signifies the kind of forgiveness or the truth and sincerity of the forgiveness which we and God extend, that God will as truly forgive us as we certainly and truly forgive our neighbour from the heart. Or, to express it more briefly, we may say that there is here not a comparison according to the degrees, but according to the truth and reality of the thing, so that the sense is, God so perfectly forgives us our sins, as we truly and certainly forgive our neighbour. Objection 3. But Christ commands us in Luke to pray, forgive us our sins, for we also forgive every one that is indebted to us. Luke 11 verse 4. Therefore our forgiveness is the cause on account of which God forgives us. Answer. But this is to consider that as a cause which is none. Our forgiveness is not meritorious or the cause of divine forgiveness, but is merely an argument and proof that God has forgiven us our sins, since we have forgiven others, if not perfectly, yet still truly and sincerely. Our forgiveness cannot be the cause of the forgiveness of God, one, because it is imperfect, two, because if it were even perfect, it could still not merit anything for the reason that what we now do we owe to God. If we were now to perform perfect obedience, it would still be due to God. Yet we must not understand this as signifying an equality of forgiveness in us and God, but only as referring to a comparison of the kind of forgiveness. 
Objection 4. He does not truly forgive who retains a recollection of injuries and is desirous of taking revenge. But we all have a recollection of injuries and are desirous of taking revenge. Therefore we do not truly forgive. Answer. He does not truly forgive who retains a recollection of injuries without showing any signs of disapprobation or making any resistance thereto, and although we may scarcely be able to bury all remembrance of offences, or at least not without the greatest difficulty, yet if we only do not cherish it, but resist the remains of sin which still cleave to us, and do not give indulgence to them, there is nothing which may prevent us from true and heartily forgiving others, and of obtaining that also, on account of which Christ has added the particle as, which is, as has already been remarked, that we might rightly pray to God, which takes place whenever we pray in faith and repentance, both of which are confirmed in us by this petition. Faith is strengthened and confirmed in us by this petition, because when we truly extend forgiveness to our neighbor, we may and ought certainly to believe that our sins are also forgiven us, so that we have a good conscience and are sure of being heard, according to the promise of Christ, If ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Matthew 6 verse 14 True repentance is in like manner confirmed and increased within us by this petition, since it was chiefly to lead and provoke us to this that the condition was added, as we forgive our debtors. For if we would obtain forgiveness for ourselves, we must also extend forgiveness to others. Both causes are contained in the words of Christ as just cited. If ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. That is, then you may certainly believe that you will be heard of your Father in heaven, which words comprehend a confirmation of our faith, whilst the antithesis which follows adds a spur, or provokes to repentance. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Matthew 6, verse 15. Objection 5. But Paul did not forgive Alexander, for he says, 2 Timothy 2, verse 4, Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works. Yet he obtained forgiveness of God. Therefore our forgiveness is not necessary in order that we may obtain the forgiveness of God. Answer. Forgiveness is threefold. 1. Of revenge. This pertains to all men inasmuch as all ought to forgive revenge. It is of this that this petition speaks, and this Paul forgave Alexander. 2. Of punishment. This all cannot forgive as all cannot inflict punishment. Neither ought the magistrate to whom it belongs to inflict punishment to remit it, except for just and weighty reasons, for God desires that his justice and law should be put into execution. This Paul also forgave Alexander in as far as it had respect to him. Yet he at the same time desired that he should be punished of God, in case he would persist in sin. 3. Of judgment in reference to others. This should not always be remitted, for God, who prohibits falsehood, will not have us to judge of knaves as honest men, but desires that we should distinguish the good from the bad. Christ enjoins the same thing when he says, Give not that which is holy to the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine. Be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Matthew 7, verse 6, chapter 10, verse 16. Paul did not, therefore, sin in entertaining an opinion of Alexander as a wicked man, as long as he did not repent of his wickedness. End of section 80. Section 81 of Commentary on the Heidelberg Catechism by Zacharias Ursinus, translated by G. W. Williard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Sixth Petition. Fifty-second Lord's Day, question 127, which is the Sixth Petition. Answer, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. That is, since we are so weak in ourselves that we cannot stand a moment, and besides this, since our mortal enemies, the devil, the world, and our own flesh, cease not to assault us. Do thou therefore preserve and strengthen us by the power of thy Holy Spirit, that we may not be overcome in this spiritual warfare, but constantly and strenuously may resist our foes, until at last we obtain a complete victory. Exposition. There are some who here make one petition, while others make two. We should not, however, strive or contend in reference to the matter as long as the doctrine which is here taught is fully retained. To us the words seem rather to constitute two parts of one and the same petition. Lead us not into temptation is a petition for deliverance from future evil, but deliver us from evil is a petition for deliverance from present evil. The things which we are here to consider are the following. First, what is temptation? Second, what is it to lead into temptation? Third, what is it to deliver from evil? Fourth, why is this petition necessary? First, what is temptation? 
There are two kinds of temptation. The one is from God, the other is from the devil. The former is a trial of our faith, piety, repentance, and obedience, which is from God, through the various oppositions and hindrances of our salvation. As by all evils, by the devil, the flesh, lusts, the world, afflictions, calamities, the cross, etc., that our faith, patience, hope, and constancy may be made manifest both to ourselves and others. It is in this sense that God is said to have tempted Abraham, Joseph, Job, and David. The Lord your God proveth you to know whether ye love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Deuteronomy 13 verse 4, see also Genesis 22 verse 1, Psalm 139 verse 1. So God is also said to tempt his people by false prophets and by the cross. The temptation of the devil, or that by which the devil, the flesh, and the wicked tempt us, is every solicitation to do wrong, which solicitation itself is sin. It was in this way that the devil tempted Job, that he might draw him from God, whom he loved and worshipped, although the final issue of the temptation was different from what the devil designed and anticipated. So he also provoked David to number the children of Israel, 1 Chronicles 21 verse 1. Objection. But it is said in the epistle of James, chapter 1 verse 13, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted of evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Answer. God tempts no one by soliciting and enticing him to sin or evil, but he tempts us by trying us. But the devil, the world, and the flesh tempt us so as to entice and solicit us to sin for the purpose of drawing us from God. In this sense of the term, God tempts no man. Hence, when it is said that he tempted Abraham, Job, and David, we are to understand it to mean nothing more than a trial of their faith and constancy by afflictions and the cross. So he also, by the use of the same means, tries our faith, hope, patience, love, and constancy, whether we will also worship and serve him in afflictions. From what has now been said, we may easily perceive, since temptation is attributed to the devil and to the disordered inclinations of men, in what sense God is said to tempt and not to tempt men. Satan tempts men both by offering occasions to sin from without, and also by instigating them from within to sin, that he may thus plunge them into destruction and cast reproach upon God. Disordered inclinations tempt men because they tend to such actions as God prohibits. God, however, tempts not to destroy us, nor to lead us into sin, but to try and exercise us, when he either sends calamities upon us, or permits the devil or men or our flesh to provoke and invite us to sin, hiding for a time his grace and power in preserving and ruling us, that our faith and constancy by these exercises and trials may be more clearly manifested, not indeed to God, who knows from everlasting what and how great our faith is, and how great it will hereafter be by his blessing, but to ourselves and others, that so, by these examples of our deliverance, there may be confirmed in us a confidence of the divine presence and protection, that a desire of imitating us may be awakened in others by seeing our perseverance, and that true gratitude may be kindled in all of us towards God, who has delivered us from our temptations. It was in this way that God tempted Abraham when he commanded him to offer his son Isaac as a sacrifice. Genesis 22. So he is said to have tempted his people by withholding water from them, Exodus 15. This petition, therefore, lead us not into temptation, which Christ commands us to address to God, does not simply speak of the trials and proofs of our faith and piety, to which David willingly offers himself when he says, Search me, O God, and know my heart, try me and know my thoughts, but also of the cunning devices and assaults of the devil and of our flesh, and of desertion in external and internal conflicts. Nor does the Apostle James speak of our being tried, but of our being enticed to sin when he says, Let no man say, when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then, when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. James 1 verses 13 to 16. Hence, it is also apparent how God punishes the wicked and chastises and tempts the godly by evil spirits, whilst he is nevertheless not the cause of these sins which are committed by the devil, nor is a partaker with them in his wickedness. For that the wicked are punished by the wicked, and the good chastised and exercised, is the just and holy work of the divine will. But that the wicked execute the judgment of God by sinning is not the fault of God, but comes to pass by the corruption of the wicked, which they have brought upon themselves. God neither willing, nor approving, nor accomplishing, nor furthering their sins, 
but only permitting them, in his just judgment, when accomplishing his work and purpose through them, he either does not reveal his will to them, or does not influence their wills to regard his revealed will as the end and rule of their actions. This distinction between the works of God and those of the devil, and of God's accomplishing his just work through the devil, and of his permitting the sin of the devil, is evidently confirmed by the history of Job, whom God designed to try, whilst the devil attempted to destroy him. The same thing is also proven by the history of Ahab, and by the prophecy respecting Antichrist, where the devil deceives men that he may destroy them, whilst God permits them to be deceived, that he may in this way punish them, and suffers the devil to execute his will and purpose. 1 Kings 23, 2 Thessalonians 2. Second, what is it to lead into temptation? When God is said to lead us into temptation, we are to understand by it that he tries and proves us according to his most just will and judgments. When the devil is said to lead us into temptation, it means that God permits him to entice and solicit us to sin. We are here in this petition taught to pray for deliverance from both of these forms of temptation. We therefore pray, one, that God will not tempt us for the sake of trying us, if such be his will and pleasure, or, if he does tempt us, that he will give us strength to endure the temptation. Two, that he will not permit the devil, or the world, or the flesh to entice us to sin, or, if he does permit us to be tempted, that he himself will be present with us, that we may not fall into sin. This, therefore, is the true sense and meaning of this petition, lead us not into temptation. Suffer us not to be tempted above that which we are able to bear. Neither permit the devil to tempt us in such a way that we may either sin or wholly fall from the Objection. Temptations which are good in respect to God are evil in respect to the devil, and yet God, notwithstanding, leads us into them. Therefore God is the cause of sin. Answer. There is here a fallacy of the accident. They are sins in respect to the devil because he designs to entice us to sin by these temptations. In respect to God, however, they are not sins, because they try us and withdraw us from sin, and also confirm our faith. Temptations, therefore, in as far as they are trials, chastisements, martyrdoms, etc., are sent of God. But in as far as they are evil and sinful, God does not will them, so as to approve and affect them, but only permits them. Third, what is it to deliver us from evil? There are some who understand by the term evil, as here used, the devil. Others understand by it sin, and others death. It is best, however, to understand it as comprehending all the evils of guilt and punishment, whether they be present or future, yea, and the devil himself, the author and grand contriver of all wicked deeds, who is called by the Apostle John, according to a significant form of speech, the wicked one. I write unto you, young men, because ye have overcome the wicked one. Whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil. 1 John 2, verse 13, Matthew 5, verse 37. Cyprian understood the term evil, as here used, to include all the adverse circumstances which the enemy brings against us, from which we can have no sure protection except God deliver us. Hence, when we pray that God will deliver us from evil, we desire, one, that he will send no evil upon us, but keep and defend us from present and future evils, both of guilt and punishment. Two, that if he does here send evils upon us, he will be pleased to mitigate them and make them contribute to our salvation, that they may be profitable to us. 3. That he will at length fully and perfectly deliver us in the life to come, and wipe away all tears from our eyes. 4. Why is this petition necessary? This petition is necessary, 1. On account of the number and power of our enemies, together with the magnitude of the evils to which we are exposed, and our own weakness. 2. On account of the preceding petition, that we may obtain the forgiveness of our sins, inasmuch as our sins are not forgiven, except we continue in faith and repentance. But we will not continue in these, if we are tempted above our strength, if we rush into sin and fall from God himself. Objection 1. We should not pray for deliverance from things good and profitable to us. The temptations which are from God, such as trials by afflictions, poverty, false prophets, etc., are things good and profitable to us. Therefore we should not pray for deliverance from them. Answer, we are not to pray for deliverance from things which are in themselves good and profitable. But trials, afflictions, crosses, and other temptations are profitable not in themselves, but only by an accident, which is the mercy of God accompanying them, without which they are not only not profitable, but constitute a part of death, and lead to death both temporal and eternal. Hence, in as far as afflictions are evil in themselves and destructive to our nature, in so far are we to pray for a deliverance from them. But... 
in as far as they are by the goodness of God good and profitable to those who believe, we should not desire to be delivered from them. Or we may express it thus, that which is good and which accompanies afflictions and the cross, we should not pray for deliverance from, but afflictions and the cross itself, which are evil in themselves, being destructive to our nature, from these we should pray for deliverance, as Christ himself also prayed when he said, Let this cup pass from me, that is, let it pass from me, in as far as it is a destruction and evil, in which sense the Father himself did not desire it. But in as far as the death of Christ was a ransom for the sins of his people, in so far both Christ and the Father desired it. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. Matthew 26, verse 39. Objection 2. We ought not to pray for deliverance from what God wills, but God wills our temptations, therefore we ought not to pray for deliverance from them. Answer. We ought not to pray for deliverance from what God wills, in as far as he simply wills it, but he does not simply will temptations. He does not will them, in as far as they are destructive to us, but only in as far as they are trials and exercises of our faith, prayer, and constancy. In this respect we ought also to desire these things, and that we ought not simply to desire temptations is evident from this, that it is the part of patience to endure and submit to them, which it would not be, but rather our duty, if we should simply desire them without being permitted to pray for deliverance from them. God will not therefore have us to desire evils in as far as they are evils, but will have us patiently to endure them in as far as they are good and profitable to us. Objection 3. It is in vain that we pray for what we never obtain, but we shall never obtain a complete deliverance from temptations in this life, for all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. 2 Timothy 3 verse 12. Therefore it is in vain that we pray not to be led into temptation. Answer. There is here an error in regarding that as a cause which is none, for we pray that we may not be led into temptation, not because we are here wholly to be delivered from temptations, but because we are delivered from many temptations and evils in which we should have perished, had we not sought and prayed for deliverance. This should be a sufficient reason why we should pray as we are here taught. But we may add still further that this petition is necessary in order that the evils into which we fall may be made contributory to our salvation. Those now who desire deliverance in general obtain these two great blessings from God, notwithstanding he designs that this benefit be imperfect, even to those who desire it, on account of the remains of sin which still cleave to us, and that because he will have us to pray with confidence and submission to his will, that we may obtain it fully and perfectly in the life to come. The benefit of this petition is one, a confession of our weakness in enduring temptations, even the smallest, that no one may be unduly exalted and filled with conceit, as Peter was, when he declared himself willing to die with Christ, and that no one may take to himself the glory of his confession and sufferings, seeing that the Lord himself teaches us humility, saying, Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. Let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. Matthew 26, verse 41, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 12. 2. A declaration of the miseries and evils of this present life, that we may not become secure and fall in love with the world. 3. An acknowledgment and confession of the providence of God, which, as Cyprian writes, teaches that the devil can effect nothing against us, except God first give him permission, which should lead us to reverence and fear God, since the wicked one can accomplish nothing in all our temptations, except God give him power to do so. God now grants Satan power over us, according as we permit sin to reign in us, as it is said, Who gave Jacob for a spoil, and Israel to the robbers? Did not the Lord? He against whom we have sinned. For they would not walk in his ways, neither were obedient to his law. Isaiah 42 verse 24 This power too, which is given to Satan, is twofold, either for our punishment when we sin against God, or for our glory when we are tried and exposed. This is Cyprian's view of the subject. It is proper that we should here notice the order and connection between the different petitions which we have now considered. 1. The Lord commands us to seek the true knowledge or profession of God, which is the cause of all his other blessings. 2. That God would rule us by his Spirit, and so continually confirm and preserve us in this knowledge. 3. That every one may by this means properly discharge his duty in his appropriate sphere and calling. 4. That he would give us those temporal blessings necessary that every one may perform his duty. The fourth petition, therefore, agrees with the preceding, for if it is necessary that we should all be in our proper calling, we must live and have what is necessary for the support of life. 
5. The petition for temporal and spiritual blessings follows next in order, and is thrown in to meet our unworthiness, that thou mayest give us temporal and spiritual blessings, forgive us our debts. The fifth petition is therefore the foundation of the rest. If this be overthrown, the rest will likewise fall to the ground. For if any one has not the assurance that God is reconciled to him, how can he know him to be merciful? How can he continue in that knowledge which he has not? How can he do his duty and the will of God when he is the enemy of God and desires contrary to his will? How can the gifts of God contribute to his salvation? 6. After the petition for temporal and spiritual blessings, the petition for deliverance from present and future evils follows, being the last. From this last petition we return again to the first, deliver us from all the evils of guilt and punishment, present and future, that we may know thee, our perfect Saviour, that so thy name may be sanctified by us. Question 128. How dost thou conclude thy prayer? Answer, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory for ever. That is, all these we ask of thee, because thou art our King and Almighty, art willing and able to give us all good, and all this we pray for, that thereby not we, but thy holy name may be glorified for ever. Exposition. This conclusion contributes to the confirmation of our faith, or to our confidence of being heard, seeing that God is willing and able to grant what we desire and pray for at his hands. Thine is the kingdom. The first reason is drawn from the duty of a king, which is to hear, defend, and preserve his subjects. Therefore thou, O God, since thou art our king, more powerful than all enemies, having all things in thy power, both good and evil, evil, so that thou art able to restrain and repress them, good, so that there is no blessing so great that thou canst not give, if it be agreeable to our nature, since we are thy subjects, be present with us by thy power, and save us, seeing thou hast a love for thy subjects, and canst preserve and defend them. And the power. The second reason is drawn from the power of God. Hear us, O God, and grant us all that we pray for, since thou art able, and thou alone, for this power rests in thee alone, being joined with infinite goodness. And the glory. The third reason is from the end or final cause. We ask these things for thy glory. We desire and look for all good things from thee, the only true and sovereign God. We profess and acknowledge thee as the author and fountain of all good things, because this glory is due thee. We therefore desire these things from thee. Therefore hear us for thy glory. For this petition and expectation of all good things from thee is nothing else than an ascription of honour and glory to thee. Hear us especially, since thou wilt grant us the things which we desire. Thou wilt do what contributes to thy glory. What we desire and pray for contributes to thy glory. Therefore, thou wilt grant it unto us. Give us, therefore, what we pray for, and the glory shall redound to thee, if thou deliver us. For so shall thy kingdom, power, and glory be manifested. Objection. We seem to bring persuasive arguments to God by which we may constrain and influence him to do for us what we pray for. But it is in vain that we use arguments with him who is unchangeable, God is unchangeable, therefore it is in vain that we thus plead with him. Answer, we grant the argument as it respects God, but not as it respects us. Or we may reply that there is here an error in taking that as a cause which is none. We do not use arguments that we may move and influence God, or persuade him to do what we ask, but that we ourselves may be persuaded that God will do this, that we may be assured of being heard, and acknowledge our necessity and the goodness and truth of God. These arguments are, therefore, not added to our prayers for the purpose of moving and influencing God, but merely to confirm and assure us that God will do what we desire and pray for. These now are the reasons on account of which he does it. Thou art the best king. Therefore, thou wilt give to thy subjects what is necessary and tends to their salvation. Thou art most powerful. Therefore, thou wilt show thy power in giving these greatest of all gifts, which can be given by no one besides thee. It shall contribute to thy glory, therefore thou wilt do it, because thou hast a regard to thy glory. Question 129. What does the word Amen signify? Answer. Amen signifies, it shall truly and certainly be, for my prayer is more assuredly heard of God, than I feel in my heart I desire these things of him. Exposition. The word Amen is not added as a part of the prayer, but is connected with it, to denote one, a true and sincere desire that we may be heard, that the thing which we desire and pray for may be ratified and certain, and that God would answer our request. Two, a certainty and profession of our confidence, or a confirmation of that faith, by which we are fully persuaded that we shall be heard. 
The word Amen signifies, therefore, one, so let it be, or let that come to pass which we ask. Two, may God, who is not unmindful of his promise, certainly and truly hear us. End of section 81. End of commentary on the Heidelberg Catechism by Zacharias Ursinus, translated by G. W. Williard. If you enjoyed this recording, please support our channel by subscribing, liking, and sharing our content. We would also be happy to receive any comments or feedback below.